Well, good evening. Welcome to the Fort Calhoun Station public meeting. My name is Rick Deese. I'm going to be the coordinator here tonight. I'm normally a senior project engineer for the NRC in the Region 4 offices in Arlington, Texas. But I'll be coordinating activities here this evening. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to come hear what these two different groups have to say. And just to let you know, we place high priority at the NRC in being open to the public and informing the public of what's, what we do and what's going on. And that's what you're going to see here tonight. That being said, let's get to the first order of business. The focus of tonight's meeting is the safety of the Fort Calhoun Station. We're not going to discuss uh, any OPPD financial business, any fiscal matters. But we're going to focus on the safety of Fort Calhoun Station. Now, as you came in, there was a table. I intercepted a few of you, and there was quite a bit of uh, information on those tables. Uh, first, there's a feedback form. Uh, that's something for us. If you would pick up one of those feedback forms and let us know how we do, we're constantly striving to make these meetings better. We need feedback on the venue, how we, uh, you know, how the presentations go, the flow, the question and answer session. Please take one of those. They're, they're self-addressed. They're postage paid. Take one home, fill it out, and drop it in the mail and let us know. Also, there's note cards out there. We're going to get to a question and answer session at the very end. And if you don't want to come up and uh, read and ask a question, I will actually read your question or comment. And that way, your comment will be heard if you don't want to come up and be filmed or have some other reason you don't want to stand up. The other information over there that it's important is that we have several pieces of information that will be referred to in tonight's presentations. One is a confirmatory action letter and restart checklist that has been revised. It's the latest as of February 2013. We have the basis document, which has also been revised from its original, and that's going to be referred to. So if you, uh, if you could take time to go pick one of those, we're going to up, we're going to be referring to those. Those would be handy to have to flip through. We also have a copy of our latest inspection report, uh, which will be referred to. And we have the, a copy of the slides that you're going to see here tonight that you can take home with you. Finally, there's a poster that we have, 11 by 17, of NRC actions taken, past, present, and future, in the wake of the Fukushima tragedy in Japan. So without further delay, let's go ahead and get started. This is a meeting between the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and Fort Calhoun Station Management. It's the latest in a series of public meetings. Now, this is the latest, latest one we've had in the uh, Nebraska area since November. And we did have a meeting in December in the D Washington, D.C. area on containment internal structures. We did have a commission meeting. The full commission met and had discussions uh, with, uh, with our management, NRC management and Fort Calhoun management in January. I see many familiar faces from past meetings. I'm glad you're back and look forward to hearing from you again. I'd also like to welcome, we have a couple of uh, staffers from uh, your re elected representative's office. We have representatives from U.S. Senator Johan's office and U.S. Senator Fortenberry's office here. Uh, present with us. And we appreciate their interest uh, in the activities that are going in on at Fort Calhoun in recognition of the importance of safe operation of that facility to the community. So what are you going to see here tonight? What are we doing tonight? What can you expect to see? Well, we have two groups of folks sitting at tables. We have the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and Fort Calhoun Station Management. At this time, I'm going to let the, these folks introduce themselves, so I'll let uh, the NRC folks introduce themselves. Yeah. My name is Tony Vagel, and I'm the chairman of the O350 Oversight Panel for Fort Calhoun. I'm Louise Lunn, and I'm the vice chair of the O350 panel. My name is Mike Hay. I'm the <coughs> branch chief in charge of oversight of Fort Calhoun Station. I'm John Kirkland. I'm the senior resident inspector at Fort Calhoun. I'm Joe Sabrowski. I'm the uh, licensing project manager for Fort Calhoun. I work in Washington, D.C. 
Thank you. Now, I'd like to give uh, the Fort Calhoun Station management folks an opportunity to introduce themselves. I'm Lou Cordoposi. I'm the site vice president of the Fort Calhoun Station, and the chief nuclear officer for OPPD. I'm Mike Prospero, the plant manager. I'm Ron Short. I'm the assistant engineering director at Fort Calhoun Station. Good evening. I'm Bruce Rash. I'm the senior recovery manager for the station. My name is Karine, and I'm the nuclear oversight manager at OPPD. Okay, with that, each of these groups is going to have a presentation. The NRC is going to present a brief status of their activities at the station, our activities at the station. Fort Calhoun Station Management is going to give a brief on the issues at the station and how they're working to resolve those issues. These two groups are going to give their presentations. You may see some questions from the NRC to the Fort Calhoun Station Management. But then we're going to take a break. Then the meeting will go into a public question and answer session and we'll turn the meeting over for your questions and comments. Okay. We're going to go till about 9 o'clock or till the question and answers are done, uh, whichever comes first. Uh, if, if there's, you know, we run out of time and you still want to ask questions of NRC, uh, NRC folks will stick around after the meeting and answer any questions you may have. So, as I said earlier, this, this, this whole session is going to be videotaped and we will post this to our special website or web page uh, for Fort Calhoun Oversight and you can look forward to seeing that posted in the near future. Now, I'm going to push those note cards again because we do want to hear from you. And uh, uh, again, uh, if you want them, just go walk back there, fill it out. One of us will pick up a note card and we will read your comment. With that, I would like to allow Mr. Vagel and Ms. Lund, the 0350 Special Oversight Panel Chair and Vice Chair, to kick off the meeting. Thank you, Rick. The first thing I want to do is uh, thank you very much for coming on this beautiful first day of spring, I think. Uh, <laughs> pretty nice out there compared to January. Uh, we really appreciate this opportunity to, to tell you what the NRC has done. Our mission to, is to ensure safety, and we do that through thorough and independent inspections. And what we're about is to validate, to ensure that at Fort Calhoun Station that the, the people, the equipment, and the processes are adequate to be able to support safe operation of the plant. And we do that through independent inspections. Since the last public meeting that we've had, we have conducted multiple inspections we have also revised the confirmatory action letter to include additional items, which we, uh, Mike Hay will discuss in more detail later, as well as we have reviewed some specific items on the basis document, including flood, uh, some of the flood recovery actions that John Kirkland will discuss. Then Fort Calhoun is going to tell us about some of their actions that they, that they have taken. And Yes, they have done a lot of work in the last three months, and we have independently validated their work. And I'll be frank, some of the work was good, and some of the work did not pass the test, our inspections, and more work needs to be done. And we'll be talking about some of those issues today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Louise. Okay, and I'll add my welcome to everyone and thank you for coming to the meeting. And you know, you see five of us up here and for folks that have um, not um, been to one of these meetings before, I don't know if everybody has been here before, you know, we have resources not only from our regional office and here the resident inspectors that are here all the time, but also, um, I'm from, in, from the uh, headquarters office. My um, job is a deputy division director in our division of operator reactor licensing. And at the end of the table, Joe Sabrowski, the project manager for the plant is here as well. And there are a number of technical reviews that happen back at headquarters as well. So we work as a team, the, both here on the, the resident inspectors on the site, the um, staff there in the regional office, as well as the technical resources back 
at um, our headquarters location <coughs> to um, review the material and make a determination. So I just wanted to sort of mention why you have um, the number of us up here, but we all represent different aspects of this review. And so I'm going to turn it over to Mike Hay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Hay. Uh, I'm the branch chief, and, and I'm, I work out of the regional office in Texas. Uh, the resident inspectors who go to the site every day uh, work for me and, and currently uh, since we're in the 0350 process most of the inspection activities are are basically coordinated uh, by me uh, so I've got a lot of uh, uh, interest in when the site is ready for inspections and obviously we do our best to support those I'd like to start off today by, by talking about some of the recently uh, revised documents that, that we've issued. Um, but, but first I'd like to discuss the, uh, the framework of, of really what we've set up to uh, deal with the site while they're in the 0350 process. We've, we issued a uh, CAL uh, over a year ago and we're, we're currently on the third revision of that CAL. Uh, recently, uh, on February 26, we issued the last revision, and that that CAL contains in it a uh, restart checklist, and that restart checklist is basically the the items that uh, OPPD has committed to perform uh, prior to restart, and uh, the NRC will then review those activities to determine if they're adequate to support plant restart. In that restart checklist. There's actually nine sections. The first four sections are the, the actual sections that we're requiring the site to conduct. And uh, if, you, if you have a copy of the restart checklist, you'll see that, like I said, sections one through four are the sections that the licensee must implement. Section one includes the causes of significant performance deficiencies and assessment of organizational effectiveness. Section two involves flood restoration activities and demonstrating that the system structures and components are able to support plant restart following the flood. <coughs> Pardon me. Section three deals with the adequacy of significant programs and processes. And section four uh, pertains to the licensee developing and then implementing what is called a integrated performance improvement plan. So those are really the four areas that, that the licensee is responsible to implement. And within those four areas, there's, there's actually 18 uh, elements that, that make up those four sections. And to provide a little bit of a, of a roadmap on what the NRC plans to do with respect to assessing those 18 areas, we developed what's called a restart checklist basis document and we have a copy of that up on the table and that that basically uh, consists of 450 plus items that that depict the specific activities that the NRC plans to, to review next slide so we issued a revised confirmatory action letter on February 26th and there's a website uh, listed there that you can go to to look at that along with you can grab a hard copy here. We, we recently revised it because we had three items <coughs> that were significant enough uh, to dictate being added to the restart checklist. Those three items included a, a number of safety system functional failures that the licensee identified and reported to the NRC. They involved uh, two issues that dealt with the qualifications of different types of equipment. One, one uh, piece of equipment deals with the uh, containment electrical penetrations, and the other deals with uh, certain columns and beams that are inside containment that, that make up the uh, containment internal structure. Next slide, please. So, after we issued the revised confirmatory action letter, as I talked about, we also have a basis document that depicts exactly what the NRC plans to inspect. So we issued the revised basis document about a week later, and that, again, uh, just further 
depicts what the NRC will do with those three items. And the safety system functional failures consisted of nine uh, different issues that, that the licensee reported to the NRC. And we plan to review uh, each one of those nine items to ensure that, that they're adequately corrected and that from, a, from an overall perspective, the licensee looks to see if there's any uh, commonalities between the problems and, 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 and therefore get an understanding of the full extent of condition. With respect to the containment penetrations and internal structures, uh, we're gonna be looking at the root cause for each one of those problems. We're gonna be looking at the licensee's extent of condition reviews, and obviously we'll be looking at the adequacy of the corrective actions for, for each of those issues. Next slide, please. I'd now like to talk about <clears throat> the current status of the inspections that we've, uh, I hate, to, I hate to use the word completed because a lot of the inspections that, that, that we've done so far are still not actually completed and on the docket. Um, but we are gonna provide some preliminary results tonight, but really not get into the specifics yet because the teams are still working on those, those details. As, as Tony mentioned, you know, the, the overall focus that we have is on the, the plant, the people, and the processes. And the, the basis document was really created with that structure in mind. So now I'd like to go through some of the specific inspections that, that we've been working on. The first one uh, is, is what's called a CAL inspection team, and uh, CAL stands for Confirmatory Action Letter. That, that team consisted of 15 inspectors, uh, and that team performed uh, two weeks of on-site inspection. They performed a couple of weeks of preparation. <coughs> Uh, prior to going on site and they performed inspections in between the on-site week. So from an inspection standpoint, uh, it was about a month of, uh, of time. And uh, like I said, it, it consisted of 15 inspectors. And there were mixed results. Uh, like I said, this is preliminary, but you know, there were, <clears throat> there were some items that, that definitely looked like the licensee was doing an adequate job. But, but there were some areas that, that still needed some more work. Um, and just, just to give you a, a, a little perspective, you know, the, the team had a, a defined scope of what they were going to look at. And that scope was obviously a number of items that are in the basis document. And back a few months ago, we had developed that scope in unison with the licensee as far as what they believed they would be done with so that it would support our inspection activities. Well, when we started the inspections, we soon realized that a number of those items were not ready for inspection. Uh, I would say roughly 35 to 40 percent of the total scope was not ready for our inspection. So we're going to have to come back at some other time to look at those items. Additionally, uh, there was a number of items that we looked at that weren't, uh, you know, thorough or didn't meet our, our standards. And so, again, those are items that we're going to have to come back and look at again. And I'll get into a little more detail about what some of those issues were. Uh, with respect to security, we had a security team inspection that consisted of five inspectors uh, from all four regions of the NRC and headquarters. Again, uh, we had mixed results. Uh, there was a, a number of greater than green security related issues that the team was looking at. I will say that the licensee did adequately address correcting the significant security issues that, that we all knew about. However, uh, what, what the team uh, was not uh, uh, satisfied with was the fact that when you look at the full extent of the condition, meaning what were the causes that created those uh, significant issues, and, and could those causes have been elsewhere in the security organization to result in other problems? And so the, the team noted that their evaluation really wasn't that thorough as far as looking at the, the, the extent of, of where these problems could be. And they went and did independent inspections in other areas and they found multiple examples in those different areas. Uh, so 
right now the 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 team is not recommending closure of the security items until the licensee performs a better extent of condition review in the security area with respect to safety culture we had a, a five person inspection team uh, who again performed two weeks on site and I will say uh, you know this this is a positive note uh, we are seeing positive changes to the overall site safety culture um, we're, we're not seeing any indications where where staff employees are hesitant to raise safety concerns either through the corrective action process or up through through their supervisors uh, although there were some isolated cases that 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 you know this wasn't universal but those isolated cases are being addressed uh, we're also seeing that there's uh, a healthy use of the corrective action process meaning there is a low threshold for people to put issues into the process to be evaluated and that's reflected in the sheer numbers of items that, that are in the process. Um, however, there, there are some areas that definitely need some more work, uh, especially with the corrective action process, and that would involve the ability to evaluate those problems that get into the process and to develop corrective actions that actually fix the problems. Uh, upcoming in April, we have an operational assessment team inspection and uh, that that's scheduled for again two weeks on site in addition to that uh, we're working with the licensee to understand when the plant might support being heated up uh, that doesn't mean it's going to go critical or starting up but it means they're just going to heat it up and and the NRC plans to have another group of operational inspectors on site during heat up activities to monitor the ability of the control room operators to manipulate the plant and to run the plant safe, uh, safely. That will give us a good indication on when they do restart the plant, if they can do it properly. Uh, with respect to containment structures and containment penetrations, we, we are ongoing in our inspection activities. Uh, with the containment structure issue, we've got two branches in headquarters who are reviewing the licensee's analysis. Along with, we have structural engineering experts in other regions of the agency that are also supporting this, this effort. With respect to flooding, there's, there's actually multiple reviews uh, being conducted by the NRC in the area of flooding. Um, there's a, there was a yellow finding that dealt with inadequate flood mitigation uh, strategies and, you know, We've been doing inspections in, in, in that area. Matter of fact, we recently issued a inspection report that is up on the table there where we identified that the licensee had not adequately corrected uh, a, a flooding issue that, that we told them existed <coughs> just about a year ago. And we, in that letter, we requested that the NRC reply to that violation so that we can understand what their intent is to resolve that that problem additionally in that report we discussed that there are two uh, violations that involve modifications that they're making to the plant that involve uh, fixing the problem with respect to uh, flooding concerns and unfortunately both of those modifications we determined we're not saying the modifications are wrong but what we are saying is that those modifications should have been reviewed and approved by the NRC prior to the licensee making those changes to the plant. Uh, so anyways, if you, if you haven't uh, got a copy of that, that's on the table there. And I, and I do hope during the licensee's presentation that, that they do plan to talk about what their, what their actions are in, in that area. In addition to those uh, areas with respect to flooding, uh, John's going to talk about the uh, restoration from the flooding event of 2011. Uh, there was obviously, you know, some things that were affected by the flood, and and John, since he's there every day on site with the other resident, Jacob, uh, they're able to follow those restoration activities. And then the third area in flooding uh, that that the NRC is is looking at is is the current 
uh, design basis flood level, does it provide adequate protection for the site based on new information that, that is out there? And the NRC is, is right now actively uh, looking at that question. And, and I think, you know, further down the road, uh, we'll be able to tell you where we're at on that. But, but we're still in preliminary, uh, uh, pre we're in preliminary e uh, evaluations now. Uh, mo moving on, we also did a special inspection that was in response to a uh, event report that the licensee submitted where they identified that the raw water pumps weren't properly anchored to their found foundation. Uh, we've, we've basically completed that inspection and we plan to exit next week. So uh, the results of that inspection should be documented probably within the next month or so. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'd like to talk a little bit about the status of items completed, even though I've kind of already delved into that. You know, if, if you look at the restart checklist and the, you know, the items that, that are in there, right now the NRC has not officially closed any of those, those items. In the basis document, which I said consists of about 450 plus item, uh, activities, We've completed and closed about a third of those. And, and I, I will tell you, there are others that, that were close to closing, uh, so that, that number will grow. But it also demonstrates that there's still a lot more work to be done. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to uh, John, and, and John's going to talk about the uh, flood recovery activities. And I would like to say that in this area, the licensee has completed just about everything, and, and, and our inspection activities are, are pretty close to being able to complete all of those inspection activities also. So, John, go ahead, please. If we think back to uh, 2011 as the uh, floodwaters receded, and this was prior to the time that uh, we transitioned for Calhoun into <coughs> manual chapter 0350 oversight, uh, we issued a confirmatory action letter uh, in September of 2011 on items that the facility uh, had to correct uh, prior to startup, and those were generally called the flood recovery plan. And there were 231 items that we called out in that particular confirmatory action letter uh, of items that they had to complete. And then a few months later, they transitioned into manual chapter 0350 and a new cow gets issued. Uh, that includes a lot more things other than these 231 items. But all of these items still had to be uh, corrected and inspected by the NRC. But that first confirmatory action letter dealt with some items that weren't directly related to the flood. So when we issued the new uh, CAL for 0350 oversight, we kind of split the items up into different areas of the restart checklist. Uh, and so Jacob and I, on a day-to-day -day basis, deal predominantly with the uh, items that were directly related to the flood. And of those uh, original 231 items on the Cal, there were 162 uh, that were directly related to the flood as far as equipment goes, and also security equipment and emergency planning and procedures. Uh, included in that 162 items were uh, 22 individual items uh, that have to do with uh, geotech and, and soils uh, inspection and investigation. Of those 162, and if you look at the inspection reports that we issue on a six-week basis, uh, we've inspected and closed out 102 of those 162. Uh, of those 102, it doesn't include the 22 geotechnical items. I'll get to those here in just a second. Uh, but to give you an idea of how we looked at the items uh, in the CAL to determine whether or not uh, they were adequate to close, it kind of depended on what the, the action was. So for example, uh, there are actions for the licensee to determine uh, if any damage was done in the uh, raw water system as a result of the flood. So what our actions in that would be is I would go out and perform 
an independent assessment, independent walk down of the system, an independent review of all the work that's been done, independent review of the uh, condition reports, and then I would compare my results to what the licensee had done in their evaluation. So that's that's one way that we look. Another way, for example, if equipment had to be replaced, we knew there were a couple pumps uh, that were damaged and were replaced. So our inspection activities in, in those instances would be um, observation of the replacement of the components, uh, review of the procedures that go into that, observation of the testing that was done after uh, completion of the work, and then a review of the testing uh, results, and again, compare that to what the licensee had done. Uh, geotechnical fits kind of into that uh, as their contractors on site uh, perform testing. Uh, we had, <coughs> excuse me, people in the field who would observe the drilling activities of the soil, people who would observe the, the ground penetrating radar testing. And then <coughs> when we get the reports in, we perform and are performing right now our assessment uh, of the reports and what the actual results mean. So of the, the geotechnical items, we are actively uh, inspecting and evaluating the reports and the modeling uh, that went into that. Uh, we expect to have our people out for one last final trip to close those out within the next month. So we should be able to see that closed. <coughs> <clears throat> and as Mike mentioned, uh, with, the, with the notable exception of those geotechnical items, uh, the majority of the uh, balance of open items, the inspection work has been completed, uh, the licensee has completed uh, their assessment. So now what we are finishing up is our comparison of our results uh, to what the licensee had on the last 40 or so items. And that's where we sit uh, currently with the, uh, the recovery from the 2011 flood. And I'll uh, give it back to you, Mike. Okay. Thanks, John. I'd now like to talk about the current assessment that the NRC has with respect to the uh, licensee's activities. We are seeing improvements. Uh, mm -hmm. We're seeing improvements in the overall site safety culture, as I previously discussed. We're also seeing improvements with respect to nuclear oversight activities. Uh, mm -hmm. Nuclear oversight is an independent organization at the site that does not report to the site vice president, and they perform their own auditing and assessing uh, functions to you know, basically provide the uh, utility with an independent uh, uh, insights. However, I, I will also say that even though nuclear oversight has stepped it up and they are getting more intrusive, uh, we, we have had an indication where nuclear oversight provided the licensee with a recommendation that consisted of they weren't recommending that we do this major Cal team inspection because based on their criteria, they, they didn't think the site was ready. Uh, the site had the NRC perform that inspection. They, they did take a number of activities that they thought would get them prepared. Uh, but as I discussed uh, previously, uh, you know, there was a number of items that, that weren't done, and there were a number of items that they thought were done that weren't done well enough. Uh, so, you know, I, I think there is still room for for uh, uh, you know, the site to listen to nuclear oversight. Uh, we're also seeing improvements with respect to plant equipment. Uh, like like Tony mentioned, we're seeing a lot of work being done to restore the plant and the equipment. Uh, they've done a lot of work with the diesel generators. They've done a lot of work with the electrical distribution system. They've done a lot of work with respect to flood mitigation, uh, electrical penetrations. I could go on and on for a long time because they have completed thousands of maintenance activities 
that truly demonstrate that the site is committed uh, to making the plant safe. And so I, I don't want this to seem like it's a completely uh, you know, negative uh, assessment because it's not. The licensee's done a lot of good work and uh, but there's more work to be done. I think I think that's really the the message that that I want to leave. Uh, with respect to challenges, and again, I've, I've already talked about these. It's you know the the biggest challenge is is getting consistent quality products uh, with respect to evaluating the problems that they currently know exist. And and you know and and the next challenge is understanding when they're ready for the NRC to come do the inspections. We've only got so many resources and we've already expended a lot of resources uh, just to find out that there's a lot more work for, for them and for us to do. And so, uh, you know, I, I think those are the two main challenges that we see today. Uh, you know, we, we don't see anything that's insurmountable uh, but but we do think there's a lot of work ahead of the licensee uh, to get prepared for the types of inspections that we plan to do. Uh, which, next slide, please, Sean. So what's the path forward? Definitely, uh, Fort Calhoun Station needs to complete their identification and their implementation of corrective actions, and they need to and they need to determine when they're ready for the inspection activities and. When, when, they're, when, when basically they feel like they've done everything and the plant is ready for restart, they need to provide in writing to the NRC that they have adequately evaluated all of their problems and that, and that they believe the plant is ready for, for restart. Next slide, please. So the path forward for the NRC is, like I said, we have a operational assessment team inspection that's planned for April. We're going to perform a security follow-up <coughs> inspection uh, to look at the licensee's extent of condition review. We're going to do follow-up confirmatory action letter inspections to follow up on some of the items that weren't completed uh, and that weren't done uh, at a high enough quality. And, and we're also going to have to look at a lot of other things that we haven't even yet planned for uh, but we're waiting for the licensee to complete those those items. So, you know, there's there's a lot of work to be done by the licensee, and there's a lot of work to be done by the NRC. And and like Tony said, you know, our our overall priority is is plant safety, and the way that we do that is we will perform <laughs> thorough and independent ver verification of of all of those activities that we review. With that, I'd like to turn it over to OPPD. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Bagel. And again, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Lou Cortaposi. I'm the Fort Calhoun Station Site Vice President and the OPPD Chief Nuclear Officer. I, I would like to take a minute, though, by means of introduction, to, to first invite all of the OPPD and support personnel working at Fort Calhoun in the audience just, just to briefly stand up. Thank you. And we do want to thank you for your continued support for the work we're doing at the station. But I'd also like to acknowledge the men and women that are at the Fort Calhoun station tonight who are working safely on site at the plant this evening, really on a number of the activities that we're going to touch on. Just by means of refresher, to my right is Mike Prospero, our plant manager, Ron Short, our assistant engineering director, who also is deeply involved with the recovery activities that we're performing, Bruce Rash, our recovery manager, and Carrie Enan, the OPPD nuclear oversight manager. We'll have four main topics for discussion tonight. Mike will provide an update on plant status and schedule for restart readiness, as well as the number of activities that have been completed since our November meeting. Mike, Ron, Bruce, and I will then discuss the continued progress we've made on our restart commitments. I'll discuss our plan for sustained improvement that we'll transition to and implement after restart to continue our vision towards sustained excellence, as well as mention the lessons learned from the recent inspection activities. And Mr. Eden will update us on the independent assessment of our performance at the station. And again, as we've shown at previous meetings, each of these presentations and the progress we've made is tied to our renewed vision, mission, and values 
that we continue to ingrain into each of our staff. With that, I'll turn the presentation over to Mike. We'll discuss plant status. Michael. Thank you, Lou. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Mike Prospero, the Fort Calhoun plant manager. I will cover four topics this evening regarding the status of Fort Calhoun. In the past public meetings, I shared with you the actions we are taking to improve safety and human performance. I will give you a brief update on these areas this evening. I will also provide a summary of the work we have accomplished and our schedule for the remaining work. We will be ready for restart. We reinforce our expectations to our staff and their supervisors and our managers. We are seeing clear and continuing progress in industrial safety and human performance. In January 2012, our performance in safety and human errors was in the fourth quartile. We are among the lowest performers, we were among the lowest performers in the industry. We are now among the best in the industry. This slide and the next slide show the performance in industrial safety and human performance for the U.S. nuclear power plants. I am proud of what we've accomplished here. In just one year, our industrial safety performance has risen from the lowest in the industry to top quartile. This is an extraordinary accomplishment for the site. We have also experienced significant performance improvement in reducing human errors. As you can see from the chart, in January 2012, our human performance also ranked as the lowest performing plant nationwide. Today our performance has risen into second quartile. This is a tremendous improvement and moves us closer to our goal of excellence. These results in safety and human performance are clear indicators that we have the right stuff. Clear expectations, thorough planning, discipline in performing our tasks, and accountability for our actions. These behaviors are what will allow us to safely restart Fort Calhoun Station and return the plant to sustained excellence in performance. Fixing the plant has been a priority. During 2011, we were dealing with and recovering from the flood. In the first three quarters of 2012, we were finding and analyzing our problems and identifying necessary actions. In the past four months, we have completed approximately 20,000 tasks. We are fixing our plant. Today, we have approximately 5,000 tasks to be completed prior to restart. Nearly 3,900 of these tasks are necessary to complete reloading the fuel into the reactor. Approximately 1,000 additional tasks need to be performed to heat up the plant using non-nuclear heat to be ready for startup. These tasks are in the schedule and are being planned and worked. I'll now want to highlight a few, just a few of the remaining major tasks. There are three major tasks to complete prior to fuel load. We have to complete the maintenance work on our electrical distribution system. We have to test the major safety systems and then we place the fuel back in the reactor. There are four major tasks we need to complete to heat up the plant. We have to complete the high energy line break and electrical equipment qualification modifications. We have to complete the necessary maintenance work to resolve equipment service life issues. We have to install the new containment penetrations and then we will heat up the plant. All of these major tasks prepare us for the final step, ensuring we are ready to start up the reactor. There are several major tasks for our final preparations. We have to complete ongoing systems, programs, and department readiness reviews. We have to complete our operational readiness assessment and we have to verify we have resolved our confirmatory action letter commitments and restart checklist items. The chief nuclear officer will confirm the CAL and the checklist items are resolved and send a ready, restart readiness report to the NRC. Finally, 
The operators will do their verifications to declare the plant is ready for startup. And the plant review committee that I chair will review our readiness and make a recommendation for restart. At that Mr. point- Mr. Pospero? Yes. Uh, Remind me just asking one question. Could you provide a little bit more context to you know the, the system readiness review? What will a system readiness review encompass? The system readiness reviews, I'll pick out the diesel generator, for example. It comes to our plant health committee. We review all the auto open items on that system. We take a look and make sure we've fixed all the open items prior to declaring that diesel operable. We'll look at make sure we encompassed all the um, equipment service life items that were that we discovered during our anal discovery and analyzing of the systems. We make sure they're scheduled to get fixed, and then we test the systems to make sure we fixed everything. Yeah, we, we, we've got some greater detail later in the presentation, but maybe Bruce just touch on a little bit now as far as, you know, what this system readiness looked like, you know, especially for some of the systems that haven't been in operation for a while, and how it'll transition into what we would consider a, a normal industry process doing quarterly health reviews uh, and, and the other tools that we use for equipment reliability. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vagel. The uh, current status of the plant health reviews is that the systems have been reviewed by the Plant Health Committee, and each system has a list of open items that need to be fixed prior to startup. The system engineering manager has a spreadsheet that he updates with his engineers on a weekly basis to confirm that those items are in the outage schedule and we're making good progress on completing those. I will discuss this issue in further detail in my presentation. So the system health reviews are a part of the system readiness review? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. <clears throat> and then the, the program reviews that you'll be conducting, what did, so you've already selected the program specifically that you'll be looking at? Yeah, yeah. That, that, go ahead. Bruce. Yes, we have. We, it's a very similar process where instead of the system engineers doing the review, it's the program engineers. And then those program health reports are reviewed by the Plant Health Committee, which is chaired by Mr. Prospero, the plant manager, and is comprised of the other senior directors at the station. And those folks and the engineering staff uh, ensure that those programs are ready. In addition, the programs go through a corporate Exelon challenge review with the Exelon corporate experts in the program areas and from, and we draw on expertise in the fleet. If uh, corporate doesn't have the expertise, then we get it from another Exelon plant. Mm -hmm. And those challenges are complete. And then there is punch list items for those items that the program manager and the plant staff are tracking to completion. Okay, uh, thank you for the clarification. Yes, sir. Our current schedule shows that we'll be able to load fuel in the reactor by mid-April. This photograph looks down into a reactor that is partially loaded with fuel to give you an idea of what uh, loaded uh, fuel in the vessel would look like. The next step is to heat up the plant to normal operating temperature. We will do this with non-nuclear heat. This will allow us to check out all the systems and ensure we are ready for restart. Heat up is scheduled for mid-May. Finally, we will be ready to restart the reactor by the end of May. Improved leader and worker performance and effective coordination between operations and the engineering maintenance and other support departments will result in a successful completion of the work and return Fort Calhoun to operation. We still have work to do and we will do it well. I have accomplished, I have established clear priorities and goals for this station. Our first focus is always on safety, nuclear, radiological, industrial, and environmental safety. Our other priorities are implementing the right standards, cultures, behaviors, and accountability to assure successful, air-free human performance. Having a bias for action to fix the plant and fix it right the first time. I'm going to use the corrective action program to identify our own gaps toward excellence and continuously improve. And we'll use our training programs to support continuous improvement. 
Later this evening, I will discuss in more detail the progress we are in improving our corrective action program. This photograph shows six of our dozens of first-line supervisors. They are the key to our success. They are the quarterbacks leading each one of our teams down the field. We are clearly seeing improved leader and worker performance across the station, and we are fixing the plant. We are improving performance at each step and striving for excellence as we approach plant heat up, and we will continue to improve after restart. We are driving for restart. I am now going to pass the presentation back to Lou. Before you go on, no, Mike mentioned it, and I think I, I did as well. There, there's three facets, you know, the people, the, the processes, and the plant equipment. You know, you discussed it equipment, you discussed a little bit on the processes that you'll make sure that the programs are working. Tell me a little bit more, what are you doing to make sure that the operators will be ready to safely heat up the plant and then operate the plant? So I, um, people, that's our most valuable asset I think you'll ever have in any organization. Um, I started with the people on first fixing our personal safety. Those behaviors with personal safety Obviously, we were number 104. We are no longer there. We are tied for the best. I fixed their behaviors associated with personal safety. The next behaviors that we need to fix and continue to fix are the human performance. We've moved up, as you've seen on the charts. Those are the same behaviors that the operators will use when they go to do a valve lineup, make sure the valves are properly positioned. They are the same behaviors the operators will use when they respond to an enunciator. We have brought in other assessment teams to take a look at them. We went back to the fleet to get some assistance. They had a special team come in in the beginning of the March to take a look at the operators, to follow the operators around. Uh, we'll continue to do that. And all those, those behaviors and the culture of the operators that we've worked on with safety and human performance, the results will show and have showed in the manipulations of the bus outages and the electrical com components, running the diesels to do it air free so they won't want misalign a piece of equipment. Yeah, just, just to build, you know, maybe more specifically, I'll start with the licensed operators. You know, obviously, the, the continuing training program has continued, and it's a vital part mm -hmm. for keeping the skills honed for, you know, emergency and abnormal activities. And we've been able to augment that even with what we call normal operations, you know, periods of normal operation and what that looks like. Uh, as Mike mentioned, uh, you know, the external assessment teams, you know, coming in from operating plants and, and, and as we bring more equipment online, what the operator techniques out in the field look like for monitoring operating equipment uh, and, and even, you know, housekeeping conditions and, and again, getting that operating mentality uh, back into the operating crews. We're still doing additional work uh, with those teams. We've had the non-licensed operators, some, you know, we've had, a, as Mike mentioned, the, the people component, a lot of new people that we brought into operations, some which haven't seen the plant run. Uh, we've not had an opportunity to send them to running plants so they can make plant tours for what it looks like in an operating facility, uh, all, of, all in that, uh, you know, all in the, in, in the plan, as we've mentioned, to get that operating tension, uh, you know, back in the organization. You know, we talked about the first line supervisors up there, which also includes our shift managers and our control room supervisors, and what they look like driving the organization, you know, daily as, as plant issues come up, as schedule issues come up, that operations is, is driving the ship, driving the boat, is another key focused area for us as we transition from this outage period. Uh, thank you. Now, what about the piece of procedures, operations procedures? I think it was uh, last year uh, that we had uh, inspections and we identified in the operating licensing area specifically, we identified multiple areas where there, some of the procedures were inadequate. What have you done here in the last year or so to make sure that the procedures will be adequate to support operations? For the uh, um, in license operating class and procedures, you're referring to the AO, uh, um, uh, abnormal operating procedures and emergency operating procedures. Those identified in that exam we've gone through and um, uh, fixed them where they were necessary, enhanced them when they were necessary. We do know we have more procedures we need to go through. 
Um, we are where we got a team established to begin going through those, and we have been going through those, and we will continue to go through those. Um, one of the other uh, fundamentals we are really working on uh, with the procedures, if you can't perform it, stop, fix it before you move on. Yeah, just, just to build a little bit on that, and it, and it starts with operations. You know, the department readiness process also has, a take, also has us take a look at, you know, any existing backlogs, whether that might be, you know, qualifications in a specific department, but also procedures. I think the team has done a good job looking at backlogs of enhancements and actual procedure changes and, and designated, you know, pre and post restart, and we do monitor progress on that. Uh, one of the specific areas we are re-looking at, though, is the enunciated response procedures which was one of the items that was provided feedback for us. And, and we've got some external folks taking a look at that and, and helping us best understand what that gap looks like. And, and the feedback in, in many cases was, you know, the procedures were written for maybe a, a level of experience or a more experienced operator. And, and so that's what we're standing back. That subset right now is, is still under review uh, from the enunciated response procedures. And, and you know, for, for uh, people in the audience, you know, that's sometimes the initial indication that comes into the control room and is often the procedure that takes us to a, another procedure, um, or in some cases yeah. it, it, it provides direction to correct the, uh, you know, the, the isolated event. Yeah, but that is an area we are focusing on right now. Okay, oh, good, thank you. A, a slightly more direct question, but similar to Tony's. Uh, the, the violations that, that we issued about a year ago, I know, I know there was 15, 16 examples of inadequate ops procedures. And I do know that that's in the scope of the inspection coming up in April. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious if you already validated that you've taken actions to address those specific examples? We, have, uh, we are going through them again. At this time, we believe that we have validated th those examples. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And another independent look at them. Yeah, and just, and just to build, you know, one of our fundamental performance deficiencies that we identified through the 95003 process is, is procedures. And, and so that gives a more holistic approach. You know, everything from, you know, how do we get procedure changes to be more efficient, uh, you know, how we better prioritize them, and again, another look at the backlog. Um, you know, not only in operations, but in other departments as, as we've gone through different procedure upgrades, you know, over the years. And, and, and there's some initial actions uh, that have been taken. There's some pre-restart actions that we believe, and, and we believe there's some post-restart actions also. All right, I'll take it back, Mike. Uh, this slide starts with an overview and really kind of provides the framework for a, a, a good bit of the discussion that we'll be providing. It, it lists our six commitments in the confirmatory action letter, and we've also included a cross-reference to the restart checklist items in parentheses. And so we'll, we'll briefly show progress in, on each of the commitment and restart checklist items, and, and we'll show uh, in detail uh, the ones that we're going to provide additional information on. So just to begin with, in describing the status of the CAL commitments and checklist items, <coughs> excuse me, I'll first show our status at the time of our last meeting uh, in November of 2012, and, and then we'll show progress we've made since November. And again, the items in blue tonight are the ones we'll provide greater detail. So for example, here on commitment one, uh, here is our status that we provided, again, across scoping, discovery, analysis, and implementation uh, in November. With, uh, with notable progress, and as mentioned in, uh, in the NRC's presentation, one golf, which is safety system performance indicator, uh, was one of the items that was added. Uh, it, it's in our plan, as, as, the, as the NRC mentioned. You know, it's a series of looking at the licensee event reports that we did, the corrective actions that we've taken, and, and then collect, collectively what that data set is, uh, is telling us. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Ron Short, and he will provide additional detail on progress that we made in the area of flood protection. Ron. Thanks, Lou. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ron Short. Again, I'm the Assistant Engineering Director at Fort Calhoun. Tonight, I'm going to give you an update on our progress in resolving the yellow finding on our flood protection at the station. I'm also going to describe for you how we protect against flooding at Fort Calhoun Station. We are protected against the design basis flood, which is well beyond what we experienced in the historic flood of 2011. <coughs> Being protected against the design basis flood is one of the requirements in our license from the NRC. I will also explain how the design basis flood was determined 
in how we protect against it. During 2010, the NRC identified a number of concerns regarding our flooding protection and procedures. These concerns resulted in the issuance of a yellow NRC inspection finding. That finding is captured as item one alpha in our restart checklist and is part of confirmatory action letter commitment number one. We initiated and completed comprehensive actions to understand the scope and causes of this issue. We identified and analyzed our shortcomings in this area and identified needed corrective actions. We improved our flood barriers and procedures and validated the design of our flood penetration seals using first-of-a-kind testing in the industry. We documented our act all of our actions in a closure book for restart, checklist item 1 alpha, and Lou declared the closure book as ready for inspection. One item remains for restart, which I, I will discuss in a minute. In addition, we have the capability to mitigate the effects of extraordinary floods far beyond our design basis flood. I will discuss this in detail as well tonight. Bottom line, Fort Calhoun Station is safe from floods. During a flood, we need to carefully control the water level in our intake cells to provide enough water for our important cooling systems. But we cannot allow that level to rise to where it could damage equipment. Previously, we used very large gates, called sluice gates, and left one of the gates slightly open to provide this flow control. This approach is described in our current license. We have modified this approach and installed new piping and valves, allowing the plant operators far better flow and level control in the intake cells. In a flooding situation, the operators will monitor level in the intake cells and adjust the level using four flow control valves. This is a significant enhancement in the equipment the operators use to accomplish this important safety function. One remaining step in completing this modification is to resolve the proper safety classification of the piping. That work is ongoing. I am now going to cover a number of topics associated with flood protection at Fort Calhoun. Say, hey, Ron, can you, can yes. you hold on a second here? Can you? Can you explain in a little more detail what you mean by that? That's the remaining activity is to understand the piping classification. Yes, Mr. Hay, the, uh, the piping that we have installed, uh, the majority of the piping is safety related piping. We have a, a couple elbows that are used also in the piping runs that are limited safety related or limited Q as we call it. So we're evaluating whether those elbows as limited Q are, are acceptable in this application. Okay, I, I guess the only reason I'm confused is because we've already talked about that. And I thought that was the basis for us saying that we were giving you a violation and now you're telling me you're still evaluating if that's acceptable or not. I, I guess I'm, I'm confused. Uh, does that mean in your response you're gonna be denying the violation or, or, or you're still evaluating that? We're still evaluating it. I think our response is due uh, April 10th, if I remember correctly. All right. Okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to understand where, you know, what what you're doing. So. Okay. Yeah. Just to build on that, Mr. Hay, what what we anticipate, and as Ron mentioned, we are we are still working on it. That, um, you know, as, as we look at the strategy, we, we know it's an enhanced strategy. We also believe it it will, you know, undoubtedly re require license amendment request and, and what that looks like and how we get that. Uh, in front of the NRC and for approval, uh, we believe will be part of the strategy, but we're, we're still working through that piece as, okay. uh, as, as Ron mentioned. Okay, thank you. I am now going to cover a number of topics associated with flood protection at Fort Calhoun. First, I will describe the system of six dams and reservoirs that span nearly 1,000 miles of the Missouri River <coughs> upstream of the station. These dams and reservoirs are in Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Montana. Next, I will explain how the design basis flood was determined and how we protect Fort Calhoun from the design basis flood. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, this is a requirement of our license. Finally, I will describe additional measures that we voluntarily put in place in the 1990s to mitigate the potential consequences of floods far beyond the required protection against the design basis flood. 
This slide shows nearly 1,000 miles of the Missouri River upstream of Fort Calhoun Station and identifies the location of the six major dams and reservoirs along that section of the river. As you can see, the Gavin's Point Dam is in Nebraska. The Fort Randall, Big Ben, and Owyhee Dams are in South Dakota. The Garrison Dam is in North Dakota. And finally, in Montana, is the Fort Peck Dam. These dams were constructed and are operated by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They were built over 60 years ago to control flooding along the Missouri River. The flood that occurred in 2011 was caused by unusually high precipitation and springtime snow, snow melt along the Missouri River and in the mountains. The Army Corps of Engineers significantly increased flow from the reservoirs, and that resulted in the 2011 Missouri River flood. Fort Calhoun Station safely handled the 2011 flood. The Fort Calhoun license contains requirements that the plant have physical protection against the design basis flood. The design basis flood was determined in the 1960s from analysis by the Army Corps of Engineers. The design basis flood would involve extreme precipitation and the failure of the Oahe or Fort Randall dams, releasing their reservoir. For the Fort Calhoun design basis flood, the Missouri River would rise an additional seven feet from the highest flood level seen in 2011. Fort Calhoun has physical protection and is safe in the event of a design basis flood. I will now go into more detail regarding the design basis flood and our protective features. The Corps of Engineers estimated the level of our precipitation flood that would be expected to occur only once in 1,000 years. OPPD made the ground elevation of the Fort Calhoun site the same as that estimated flood level and the site would remain dry. All critical structures are sealed three feet higher to provide safety margin and to account for wave action. This was approximately the height of the 2011 flood. There is another term, the prob probable maximum flood, or PMF. The PMF was estimated by the Army Corps of Engineers to be a higher and less likely precipitation flood than the thousand year flood. We designed removable barriers that could, can be installed before a probable maximum flood and protect critical structures and equipment for an additional six feet of height, well above the probable maximum flood. Finally, the Army Corps of Engineers estimated the flood height from a probable maximum flood with the addition of an Oahe or Fort Randall dam failure that would allow the rapid release of, of water behind one of those dams. This is the Fort Calhoun Station design basis flood. There are a few items in the plant where we would use sandbags to provide one additional foot of necessary protection in the event of a design basis flood. Our actions and response to, re response to restart checklist item one alpha assure these protective features as required in our license are robust and well maintained. I would now like to describe additional mitigation strategies OPPD has put in place to respond to even more extraordinary floods. The NRC issued a letter received by us in the early 1990s requesting each reactor operator in the United States to reevaluate external events that could affect the safety of the plant. This analysis was called the individual plant examination for external events, commonly referred to as the IP IEEE. One external event evaluated by OPPD was flooding far beyond the design basis flood. In the early 1990s, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers provided the results of a new analysis of even more severe potential floods along the Missouri River. This new scenario estimated the flood height at Fort Calhoun from one, the probable maximal flood involving extreme precipitation, two, the failure of the Wahi Dam releasing its reservoir, and three, the failure of all three downstream dams, the Big Bend, Fort Randall, and Gavin's Point dams, also releasing those three reservoirs. So this new scenario is the probable maximum flood with rapid release of the lakes behind those four dams. The resulting flood height at Fort Cannon Station would be approximately 15 feet above the design basis flood. 
OPPD developed a strategy using portable gasoline-driven pumps and hoses that could be used to cool the reactor core in the event of this extraordinary event. This strategy is designed to cool the reactor core for a flood 21 feet above our license requirements or about 28 feet above the 2011 Missouri River flood. In addition to the actions to resolve restart checklist item 1 alpha, OPPD has decided to examine, validate, and verify the quality and effectiveness of these mitigation strategies and take identified actions before restart to ensure that these core cooling strategies are robust. <clears throat> In addition to estimating the flood height for this extraordinary flooding occurrence, the IPEEE also included estimate of the frequency and consequences from these flooding events, what we call in a reactor industry, we call core damage frequency. During the 1990s, it was estimated that the probability of damage to the reactor core from all external flooding scenarios at Fort Calhoun, including the most severe scenario, was four in one million. So the risk from flooding is not significantly different from the risk of other events that could affect the reactor, a risk 25 times below the NRC safety goals and deemed safe by OPPD and the NRC. Additionally, as a result of an event at a reactor in Japan in 2011, OPPD is responding to a new NRC requirement and is reevaluating flooding protection measures at the Fort County Station. That reanalysis is required by the NRC to be completed in March of 2014. I would now like to turn the presentation back over to Lou pending any questions. Thanks, Ron. I'll provide status update on commitment two items, and I'll specifically provide an update on actions to address restart checklist item one echo regarding our safety culture and our improved station alignment around this core value. As noted, we've made significant progress in reestablishing a strong nuclear safety culture with our people. And it's interesting, as I've interfaced with members of the community, community I'm sometimes asked, what, what is nuclear safety culture? or safety culture. We in the nuclear industry and at Fort Calhoun Station define it as follows, but there's a couple words or a couple key points I'd like to emphasize. You know, it is those values and behaviors in the organization modeled by the leaders and internalized by our staff that serves to make nuclear safety our overriding priority in our decision making and in all that we do. This defines us as nuclear professionals and is truly necessary for us to safely manage our special and unique technology. With respects to our safety culture improvements, again, we performed a thorough root cause analysis using independent experts in safety culture and implemented a series of comprehensive actions to improve our culture. We integrated our new leaders and our blended management team and looked at how we embody and continue to embody those culture and values. Our improved corporate and site governance and oversight and procedures, constantly looking over our shoulder to ensure that we're establishing the right nuclear safety expectations. I've talked about the two C's meetings before. Again, where I get an opportunity to get face to face with small groups of employees. I'm able to use this unfiltered employee and feedback and information as another means to trend how we're responding to employee concerns and how we're addressing them. We talked about our improved correction act, corrective action program and Mike Prospero again will spend additional time on that in greater detail so that we can again look at how we're finding and fixing our problems. And again, we continue to strengthen our employee concerns program as a means and a viable option for our staff to capture concerns. And finally, we continue with our randomly selected pulse surveys where about one sixth of our staff each month are asked a series of critical questions as well as an opportunity to provide us feedback. This has allowed us to identify additional specific areas and issues that we need to focus on. We believe we've developed an industry best method of surveying our staff and produce a statistically useful method of assessing our progress in safety culture. This chart shows the progress and the steady progress we've made over the past seven months. And beneath this high level data, there's a, there's a level of detail and granularity now that we've gone through the entire site that it helps us to assess and drive performance improvement with both site-wide initiatives as well as department-specific initiatives. 
And we've shared this highly effective tool with our peers across the industry as an innovative method to assess and monitor safety culture. If there's no questions, we'll move on to the progress on Cal commitment number three. Commitment number three concerns our plant hardware. And again, here's our status on the first three items under Cal Commitment 3 with uh, system health reviews as uh, we'll spend some greater detail on. Again, we continue to make progress in these areas, and Bruce will discuss our efforts with respect to system health reviews. This is the status of the remaining three items under the Cal Commitment number 3. And again, progress on these items, Bruce will provide details specifically on the containment penetration design and the internal structure, uh, the internal structure issues. Again, these were new items that were identified and discussed during the November meeting, and as I mentioned, have been added to the uh, restart checklist and part of Cal commitment number three. <coughs> so with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Bruce. Bruce. Thank you, Lou. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bruce Rash. I'm the recovery manager for the Fort Calhoun station. Tonight, I'd like to discuss with you the progress and status of three items, the system health reviews, the resolution of design issues with our electrical containment penetrations, and the actions we were taking prior to restart regarding the design issue with our containment internal structure. During our discovery activities, we performed an assessment on, of the reactor safety strategic performance area consistent with an NRC procedure. As part of this work, we developed detailed reviews, field walkdowns, and verifications of five systems. The diesel generator system, the high pressure safety injection system, the safety related electrical distribution system, the reactor protection system, and the ox feed water system. These are some of our most important safety systems. In addition, we perform system health reviews for 27 of the most important systems for safety at the plant. The procedures used for the system health reviews were based on industry best practices. The system health reviews involved evaluations of the most important components in the system with respect to risk achievement worth, a review of all condition reports and work orders during the past five years, and a detailed walk down of the system to examine the equipment condition. These system health reviews were performed by a team that included the system engineer, an operator, and a maintenance staff member. The outcome of these reviews was a comprehensive report documenting the health of the systems. These detailed reports were reviewed by a senior reactor operator and a senior maintenance staff member before they entered the approval process. Then all of the system health review reports were reviewed and approved by the Plant Health Committee. The Plant Health Committee, as I mentioned earlier, is chaired by the plant manager Mike Prospero and includes many of the key managers, including the engineering director, the maintenance director, and the operations director, and others. Any issues that were identified during the system health reviews were entered into the corrective action program. Some of the noteworthy items are listed on this slide. Uh, they're examples from the walkdowns and the reviews that the system engineers perform with the team. Uh, what's important about these items is that they reveal the higher level of expectations and standards that the staff demonstrated when performing these reviews. The system engineering staff will continue to complete system health monitoring and system health reviews required by plant procedures and present the results to the plant health committee on a quarterly basis. I would now like to transition to an issue that our staff identified regarding the containment electrical penetrations. Hey Bruce, I got a quick question for you. During our last team inspection, we, within the scope of that team inspection, was a number of system health reviews that we were going to look at. And, and you know, uh, going back to one of the statements that I made previously, uh, the intent of our inspection activities is to validate that, you know, the systems are ready for restart. 
And so we were assuming that your system health reviews that you wanted us to look at would demonstrate that the systems were ready to support plant restart. Uh, but when we looked at them, the system health reviews that we got basically concluded that the system was not yet ready to support plant restart. And I, I know we had discussions about, you know, what is the NRC going to do with that? We're not obviously, you know, there's nothing really from an inspection standpoint that we could do other than, yes, we agree, it's not ready for restart. So I, I guess what I'm getting at is in for future system health reviews that you all determine are ready for NRC inspection, are you going to have a report that says the system is ready for restart and here's why? Thank you for the question, Mr. Hay. The, the answer to the question is, as you know, we have about 5,000 activities that we're still working down that Mr. Prospero showed earlier on his slide. There are outstanding work items that are in the outage schedule that the outage manager and the system engineering manager are tracking. And what we would like to have is a, a list of zero to show the NRC. I think what we will end up with is system health review reports that have a very small number of open items that are clearly demonstrated that they're in the outage schedule and the reviews can be judged by the NRC inspector in terms of quality and then when those punch list items are completed uh, we can review those with your staff e either through Mr. Kirkland or the other inspectors and demonstrate prior to the submittal of the restart letter that the plant systems that are required by the tech specs are indeed ready for startup and meet the tech spec requirements demonstrating that the plant's safe. Yeah, th I, think, I think that's a good learning though. Uh, you know, for our staff and, and recognizing the dynamics of the situation as we went through the initial system reviews in the, you know, latter part of November and December, and as Bruce mentioned, whether it was equipment service life or other physical deficiencies that we knew were in the outage schedule, about how we can better give real-time status of, of, you know, what's in the system. You know, in part we were, uh, you know, demonstrating what the process looked like and the rigor in the process. Uh, but I think we missed an opportunity to say here's real time what's left in the schedule and be able to show that linkage to the outage schedule for uh, for some of the systems that were inspected. And I think that's what Bruce touched on, which uh, we will demonstrate going forward. Yeah, and I, and I, and I, I think that's important is, you know, the at least the, the limited review that I did on one of the system health reports, uh, which was the emergency diesels, you know, there were a lot of things that had to be done yet. And it wasn't clear to me that in that document it said when they would be done. Uh, there was a number of CRs that were listed, which are condition reports, for those that don't know, that, that were listed in the system health report that said, you know, these were problems that were put into the corrective action process related to the diesels, but it didn't describe how those problems were resolved. And so, you know, I guess what I'm asking is, you know, if, if we're going to be reviewing a system to understand if it's ready for restart, we're, we're going to be able, we're going to have to be able to read that report and understand why you believe it's ready for restart. And I, I think that's that's really the, you know, the essence of, of what I'm trying to get across. I understand the message. Thank you. Thanks. I have another follow-on question, but this is not to you, Bruce, but to Mr. Enan. Nuclear oversight, what role do you play in, in these system health reviews? to independently verify the quality of these, or do you have a role? I do have a role, Mr. Vagel. Similar to the other closure books, we do do an independent review of, of those system health mm -hmm. reviews, and we are performing those reviews. Yeah. Of those reviews, have you done some already? Yes, we have. Yeah, what, what, do you have any perspectives that you could share with us? Um, <laughs> I, I would say that our, our perspective is similar to what Mr. Hay referred to. <laughs> There's not a clear nexus in the documents from those that are listed to when they're going to be resolved. We've had to go then refer to the outage schedule to verify that the actions are indeed scheduled in the outage schedule. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we've done to resolve our concerns with those books. Okay. Thank you. Barring any other questions, uh, I would now like to talk about electrical penetration. <laughs> During discovery activities in the environmental qualifications area, 
Our staff identified that a number of containment electrical penetrations contained Teflon seals and insulation in the penetration feed-throughs. Teflon is a material that can de degrade following exposure to very high levels of radiation. If that Teflon material degrades, it could allow leakage from inside the containment following an accident. We developed a very detailed test procedure to determine whether the penetration assemblies and feed-throughs would leak after being exposed to the highest levels of radiation consistent with the Fort Calhoun accident analysis. We completed extensive testing of the penetration assemblies and feed-throughs in the as-found condition and demonstrated that the outer seal on the penetration did not leak during testing the simulated post-accident environments. The fact that these assemblies did not leak during the testing demonstrated that there was no risk to the public. The penetration assembly outboard seal did not leak during recent testing. While this situation met minimum standards, OPPD decided to replace these feed-throughs to ensure robust safety performance of the containment during the years of future operations. This decision is a clear example of an improved safety culture, decision making, and bias for action at the Fort Calhoun station. Active feed-throughs are being replaced with new, fully qualified feed-throughs. These replacements will be completed prior to heat up, and in addition, we've replaced the spare penetration feed-throughs it, they've been removed and have been capped and tested. We now have a short video uh, to help further explain this <coughs> problem, and it is by Tim Manzel, our project manager for this project. Containment penetrations will give us a way to transmit electrical signals from outside containment inside containment. And the way we do that is through a penetration seal system where the conductors actually pass through a seal to get into containment. The problem that we found was that a large number of our non-safety, non-environmentally qualified feed-throughs were insulated with Teflon insulation and they had Teflon seals for the penetration barrier. If the Teflon seal or the insulation were to fail, it could challenge the containment integrity boundary. OPPD did a lot of testing after this discovery and we found that the outside seal did not fail. In other words, our containment integrity boundary was preserved, you know, all the time. However, in the interest of getting rid of the Teflon and the issues associated with the Teflon insulation breakdown, they've decided to replace all of the penetration feed-throughs before startup. All right, this is a penetration canister, and you can see that it, basically it, it looks like it's a round piece of pipe that's sealed on both ends. Through the penetration canister, we have the feed-through sub-assembly, and this is one penetration feed-through right here. Now this particular one is one of the ones we're going to replace. You can see this sealant right here that seals the wires as they go in is made out of Teflon. The insulation on the wires are also made from Teflon. This entire tube and its associated wires or conductors are going to be removed and replaced with one that looks more like this. And you can see that this one has a different type of sealant. This is called polysulfone and the conductors are insulated with Kapton. Okay, and both of these are qualified and do not uh, break down under you know, high radiation fields. So all 342 penetrations that look like this will wind up looking like this when we're done. It removes any doubt you know, that the containment boundary at Fort Calhoun Station will remain intact if, it, if it's called upon. Getting rid of these Teflon sealed and Teflon insulated wires you know, it goes a long way towards, you know, meeting that goal. And it will definitely make a better plant. So, you know, I think OPPD has made the right decision in replacing them before, you know, they start to plant back up again. Now I would like to discuss another issue that was identified during, by our staff involving the containment internal structures. This issue concerns a number of reinforced concrete columns and beams that support equipment and systems inside the containment building. This issue does not concern the containment pressure boundary. The containment shell is robust, 
I have a sketch that will help to understand the location of the containment internal structures. So that the external shell is the dark black line that was not affected by this issue. The containment internal structures that support the equipment are these series of concrete beams and columns in, in the network inside the containment that support the equipment inside the plant. Talk a little bit about the history of the issue and the identification. The original calculations for these structures were performed in the late 1960s. While our staff was conducting engineering work for pipe support modifications inside the containment associated with our future extended power uprate, they identified that one of the beams did not meet the design requirements. Subsequent detailed investigation by our engineering staff determined that there were a significant number of deficiencies in the original calculations. Based on the scope and breadth of the calculation deficiencies, we determined it was prudent to reanalyze the containment internal structure design. Our team performed extensive walk downs of the structures to ensure that the as built condition of the structures was as described in the current drawings. This included validating input assumptions and parameters for the equipment loads that were supported by the beams and columns. In addition, we did some rebar scanning to validate that the rebar was as expected in the, in the beams. We developed a detailed three-dimensional computer model of the containment internal structure. All of the input and assumptions and parameters for the model were challenged and validated. We had a number of challenge boards and independent reviews by outside engineering firms for the models and for the input parameters. We have a very high confidence in the validity of this model and the new analysis has been thoroughly documented. The results of the analysis showed that all of the containment internal structural elements would perform their function of supporting the equipment inside the containment during all analyzed accidents. The containment internal structures have been determined to be safe for restart. Some containment internal structural elements do not fully meet design margins and will need to be modified. Because the structures are safe for restart based on our calculations, these modifications can be completed in a timely basis during future outages. Extensive planning, engineering, design work, and preparation for the modifications has begun during this outage to support the future work. I would now like to turn the presentation back over to Lou. I, I have a question before you, before you, before you move on. On uh, page 31, as far as your analysis for the containment internal structure design, you have it at 90%. What do you have left to do as far as the analysis? There is one uh, set of procedure changes that operations needs to make uh, that are being finalized. In terms of the technical work, the technical work on the containment internal structures is complete and has been loaded up in the system for the, the inspectors to look at. Uh, the Stevenson and Associates and our third, other third party reviewers have reviewed all the work and uh, it is ready for inspection. So in terms of the technical work, that is complete. We are continuing the extent of condition uh, work on the aux building and on the reactor cavity compartments. Uh, the aux building work uh, is nearly complete, is expected to be done on Friday. And then there is a talk to the project manager in Boston on the reactor cavity compartments and those are expected to be done within the next two to three weeks and we're monitoring that work. The results of the work uh, show that both the aux building extent of condition and the reactor cavity compartments extent of condition meets our uh, operability limits and won't challenge startup. 
Okay, because I know we have, we're, we're um, looking at um, some of the reviews right now, so are we going to see additional packages coming to us, or uh, is this an addition to what we have, or is what we have right now what we're going to see as far as the analysis? No, I, I think you have all the work, and as we've offered before, if the inspectors want more detailed uh, reviews with the model and with the engineers mm -hmm. that performed it, we will uh, meet them in Boston and go through it with them. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you about your extended condition that, that you touched upon with respect to the OX building uh, and, and the other areas. You, you mentioned that, that they are within your operability limits. I'm assuming that means they are non-conforming to the design criteria that's in your licensing basis? They're, they're still finalizing that. The, uh, it looks right now that they will meet all the operability limits and the details when we get them on Friday, we'll look and see if they fully meet the design requirements. I have high confidence that the reactor cavity and compartments will fully meet design requirements, won't re require any modification. The OX building, we're still evaluating. Okay, yeah, I guess I would just ask when you, when you do determine that other structures are non-conforming, uh, that we get informed so that we can obviously figure out what resources we need to uh, expend to, to, to make those reviews also. Absolutely. Thank you. Right, if there's no further questions, thanks, Bruce. We'll uh, turn ahead to slide 42. And again, there's 11 programs and processes that are captured in confirmatory action letter commitment number four. And again, in this area, uh, we've made continued progress on improving each of these first four programs. Uh, Mike will be addressing in more detail the results of our actions to improve the corrective action program. And I'll we'll briefly cycle through the other seven programs again so that we can illustrate progress uh, in those areas. Okay, with, uh, with that, if there's no questions, I'll turn the presentation over to Mike Prospero. Thanks, Lou. I will now provide an update on the progress we have made on the uh, Corrective Action Program. We have repeatedly mentioned the importance of the Corrective Action Program, along with our safety culture and our organizational effectiveness, in assuring that Fort Calhoun Station can effectively resolve our issues, close gaps, and continuously improve our performance. Nearly a year ago, we initiated actions to improve our ability to find and fix our problems and continuously improve. This slide lists just a few of the actions we have taken. We developed and implemented new a new corrective action program procedures and guidance. We have added multiple CAPCO positions or corrective action program coordinators within each department to support our staff with analytical data and quality oversight. We trained our employees on our expectations for implementing the Corrective Action Program, and we are holding our staff accountable for improved behaviors and are necessary to restart the plant and achieve excellence. This accountability has many layers. Personal accountability for doing our best, first line supervisors, managers, and directors oversight, the Corrective Action, the Condition Review Group, who reviews all initiated condition reports, the Department Corrective Action Review Boards, and the Station Corrective Action Review Board. This defense in depth will ensure that significant errors and deficiencies do not get overlooked as our performance improves before restart and continues to improve after restart. The next slides display two of the indicators that we monitor to ensure that our ability to find and fix our problems is sound and improving. First is an indicator that measures the level of engagement our staff has in the corrective action program. This indicator has revealed steady improvement in the plant staff using the corrective action program to identify issues that need to be resolved. This is a very positive leading indicator that we are making progress in reestablishing the right behaviors. The next indicator is a little busy, but shows important improvement, important trends. 
We track the number of condition reports generated each month, and this chart shows startup related and non startup related condition reports generated each month. First, look at the red bars for startup related condition reports. As I said during the, my plant discussion, early in 2012, we were scoping, discovering, and analyzing our problems. You can see from the red bars on this chart, from January through August, we completed our discovery, resulting in a large number of startup condition reports. This dropped off rapidly after the completion of discovery activities. The blue bars show non-startup related condition reports. As our staff learned and implemented the expected corrective action behaviors, you can see a steady increasing trend of startup related condition reports. This is stabilized around 2,000 condition reports initiated each month. This is a very <coughs> positive trend. Our staff is identifying issues that are small problems to prevent larger ones from occurring. I expect that this will continue at a level for some time. A normal operating plant will generate between 1,000 and 1,500 condition reports per month. We still have issues to fix, find and fix at Fort Calhoun, so our condition report generation rate is where I would expect it to be. This is a good indicator. There are just two comprehensive set of, these are just two of the comprehensive set of matrix we have in our corrective action program. These two indicators tell us our behaviors are changing and we are improving in using the corrective action to capture issues that need to be addressed. There are many examples of the right behaviors driving the resolution of issues through the corrective action program. You have heard from about several tonight. Improving the culture at Fort Calhoun to have the right safety focus, addressing containment penetrations and structured design issues, and strengthening our readiness for design basis and extreme floods. The senior leadership at the station reviews the full set of metrics monitoring the corrective action program implementation on a monthly basis and we take action to improve where necessary. The corrective action program has clearly improved over the past 12 months, but during our monthly review we felt the rate of improvement was too low and a successful resolution of issues through the corrective action program was not what we expect for restart. The corrective action review board rejection rates are too high at this time. We required each department to develop additional actions, specifically targeting areas where the performance was in greatest need of improvement. These plans are in place and are being implemented. We are improving. We are clearly moving in the right direction and we will continue to improve our performance following restart. I'm gonna, now going to pass the presentation back over to Lou pending questions. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. You can go first. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, just a quick question going back to slide 50. If I, if I look at July and August of 2012 and I specifically look at the startup condition reports that were generated uh, meaning the uh, the red bars. Can you explain, you know, there's obviously a prompt jump between June and July in the upward direction, and obviously between August and September there's a prompt jump in, in, the, in the decline. And, uh, and I'm just curious, have you evaluated what, what resulted in, 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 in both the acceleration and the deceleration of issues that were startup related? We start kicked off our uh, fundamental performance deficiencies uh, some as early as the end of June through July and August. And that is the, one of the biggest drivers for that prompt jump. And as those de uh, fundamental performance deficiencies closure came through, when we were closing them out, it mostly got closed out in September and October. And that's why you have the uh, jump down. And if you look in January and February, we're going through testing a lot of our systems, bringing them back you'll see that's why they're coming up a little bit for the uh, startup. The, the, the other piece of that, Mr. Hay, and, and, and as Mike mentioned, through the fundamental performance deficiencies and through discovery, but if you take equipment service life uh, as one example, 
uh, every item in equipment service life that either needed to be evaluated or that we believe needed to be replaced and that's down to the component level right down to the relay <clears throat> down to the switch down to the you know the nut and bolt each one of those has a separate uh, a separate condition report that condition report you know stays tracked and as we even talked through in the system readiness reviews you know as we work through those component replacements and and even as we're working through them this week on some of our electrical distribution uh, that, that that's the the other piece that that really spiked up in july august from that team's efforts that's what i was wondering because i know the equipment service life issue really identified a number of, of startup uh, conditions and i was curious if that was the, the result. there are approximately 2400 extended service life crs right okay thank you <clears throat> Now, on the corrective action program, if I'm trying to, you know, you covered a lot of territory, but just want to get to the, the real issue. For what I heard you say was the identification of issues is improving. That's the correct. The threshold is getting better, and, and I think we would agree with that from what we see from day to day and from our team. But I'm not exactly clear if you said that there's continued improvement. Tell me more. What what do you really need to improve on in the in the corrective action program? We have room to, to improve on our closure of items. We still miss some CRs. Identify them. Uh, we're not perfect yet. Um, we are striving for excellence. Right now, I would tell you this is the closeout on the closeout of our actions is where our, most of our improvement is warranted. But so what do you mean close out of? When we close out, I'm sorry. Yeah. When we close out an item, it stands alone and it's closed properly so that it doesn't happen again the issue. Okay, and so does that mean that the evaluations associated with it are, 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 are suspect or is it, I'm they're, trying they're, to understand more. It, it, for example, it may be a specific, out of a corrective act or a, a condition report, you may have five actions to take. Okay. One of those, maybe we didn't do as right as the, to 100%, maybe we did it at 70%. Some of them, it may be the evaluation, we missed it, and we didn't do it right. And what we do when we find those, we write a condition report identifying that issue. Okay. Yeah, and, and one of the pieces that the metrics are helping with is, is really getting down you know, to the department level again. And, and as we've gone through the inspections and have seen uh, you know, a lot of focus on, uh, on certainly on design and, and even you know, the containment issues that we discussed tonight fill or fit in that bucket of in some cases legacy design issues and so with with a lot of corrective actions going back to the design organization uh, and maybe I'll let Ron Short touch a little bit on some extra safety nets my term that we're using to make sure that the technical rigor uh, for those evaluations sometimes it's an issue that you know may have you know may, may have been a you know 10 or 15 years old but how do we you know how do we fix today's problems today with technical rigor and so those department level plans, you know, give us the next level or the next set of actions about what does a specific department need. And again, with the bulk of our items through discovery, have gone through a recovery engineering and, and, and primarily right now through the design engineering and to a lesser degree system engineering. And so the additional actions that we've set up, I'll, I'll let Ron touch on. Sure. As Lou indicated, the majority of the open condition reports are, are in the engineering division. Uh, so it's, it's quite a bit of work for us to complete. So what, what we've done is we brought in some additional supplemental personnel, very experienced technical people, to help our staff work through the open condition reports to evaluate them and complete the corrective actions. To make sure we do that, we've done that in a thorough manner. We've also formed what's called an engineering division department CARB. It's, it's another review board. As Mike indicated, each department has a department CARB, but this is for an engineering division level. Department CARB that's reviewing all the condition reports that are, we're closing in engineering. Uh, the, the department, it is getting better. I mean, we were rejecting about 40 or 50 percent of the condition reports that were coming through three or four months ago. We're now down to about 15 or 20 percent. What, what's important is, is the individual behaviors. We're feeding back to the individuals that closed the condition report that was, was inappropriate or wasn't complete to tell them what, what, a, what a complete response needs to be. I think it's you know, kind of leading on to a new issue in that the design and licensing basis, understanding it in the configuration control, that seems to be coming up quite often. What are you doing in that area to get a handle on that? 
Yeah, I, I was going to touch on a bit, and uh, I'll, I'll let Bruce and Ron start with that. And, and, and bef actually, before I turn that over, you know, th there's a formal training piece, but even as, as Ron mentioned, each corrective action item, you know, closure provides us a, a, a training moment with both individuals and supervisors. And, and I don't want to, I don't want to miss that piece because there's a lot of work, uh, a lot of new engineers again that we're uh, that we're bringing, uh, that we're bringing in in in, in, a, in an, the period of recovery that we're in right now, it, it really is an opportune time to, to set the behaviors, you know, from, from ground zero of what we're looking for. Uh, and I'll let Bruce and, and Ron touch on, you know, the design basis uh, type issues that we've seen and, and how we're going to use, you know, the training and oversight component to help with that. Yep. On the design and licensing basis issues, one of the things that was identified by the NRC staff was that in some cases, the codes and standards that we were using were not the proper codes and standards. We formed a team to do a root cause. We're two weeks into that, and uh, they have the sequence of events developed. It goes all the way back to 1967, uh, and we reviewed all of the codes and standards in the electrical, civil, and mechanical area to see whether or not they were in the SAR correctly and, and whether they were erroneously in the design basis documents. We have found some errors in the design basis documents and those will get corrected. Uh, our future plans include uh, rebaselining uh, those documents and making sure that if there are any licensing actions that we need the NRC to review and approve, that we submit those to NRR so they can review them. In addition, we have a walk down team walking down key safety systems with the design drawings and reviewing the design drawings against the calculations, primarily in the structural area to look at hangers on the safety related piping. They have reviewed uh, some to date, uh, completed the ox feed water system. We did find a couple of discrepancies that were entered in the corrective action system and the engineers will evaluate whether the current design as built in the plant is adequate. If it is, we'll change the drawing and update the calculation. If it isn't, we'll go fix the plant. In addition, we have a key calc review process that we've kicked off that looks at the key safety system calcs and the, the sorting of those is done by risk achievement worth in terms of the, high, the most important systems for core damage frequency and large early release fraction to make sure that we prioritize those calcs in the right sequence and then over a period of years those calcs will be reviewed and reconstituted and we have those efforts ongoing at some of our other at some of our Exelon stations and uh, it's, it's been quite successful and it takes uh, several years to get through that process it provides a couple of benefits for the oncoming engineers in that they get uh, accurate data to begin with and don't have to sort it out when they're trying to solve a problem. And to, in addition, we pair up experienced engineers with less experienced engineers and it becomes a training ground uh, of practical experience for the more junior engineers to sit with a senior person and go through the detailed engineering and calculations so that knowledge transfer occurs to our staff so we have a qualified staff to run the plant for the future years of this plant. Thank you. All right, if there's uh, no further questions, we'll move on to slide 52 and I'll provide an update on confirmatory action letter commitment number five, which is the implementation of our integrated performance improvement plan or IPIP. Let me just ask one question before you run there. Um, <clears throat> Back on page uh, 43, um, for the equipment qualification, um, you've got the analysis at 90%. Um, What's left to do? Thank you for the question, Ms. The, the, uh What's left to do is to complete the, the root cause in the HELB EEQ area. Uh, we have walked down the, the plant opened up the EEQ equipment, taken pictures, had that reviewed. Uh, we reconstituted the calculations for the high energy line breaks in the plant. There are some modifications uh, for some aux steam systems in the plant that are, are 
required to be completed, although those will be done after restart since we can isolate that system when we come online and we'll have those calcs and mods in before we unisolate the aux steam system. In addition, we reconstituted all of the harsh files for the components that are required to be EEQ. And then finally, there is a list of modifications that are being implemented in the plant. For example, uh, to get some of the components that uh, in our review we discovered were below the flood level in some of the rooms to move those components above the flood level so that they are uh, qualified for the service function to perform the safety function they're required to perform. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I'll just build on it real quick. And, and, and this one in particular, you know, we, we thought it was prudent to, to just stand back and, and just look at, you know, what it took to get this program back in a state that, uh, that it should be. And, and the implementation, as Bruce mentioned, there is physical work. And if I go all the way back to Mr. Prospero's slides, right now, if we look at the schedule for heat up, this is, this is the long pole right now. Uh, it's not extensive work, but it, it is work that we're working through you know, down at the, the terminal block or at the wires level in, in a couple of the areas of the plant. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll get us back to slide 52. And as I had mentioned, the, you know, the Integrated Performance Improvement Plan has been our, our guiding recovery document. And the plan for sustained improvement in the plan uh, is what we're going to continue to use and we're working on right now to, uh, to attain, our, attain our vision for excellence after we restart the station. So as I mentioned, we'll be updating the plan in April to capture the actions we've been working on for the three additional items uh, that were added to the restart checklist uh, and expand in, in much greater detail the work that we've uh, been doing uh, for post-restart. After restart, we're going to continue emphasis on monitoring and improving, and, and we've touched on a, a number of the issues right now, and, and as well as adding the, the insights from some of the recent inspections, uh, especially on design basis and engineering rigor. Uh, but we believe a strong continued emphasis on the corrective action program uh, as well as the training program effectiveness not only for the corrective action program but for some fundamental knowledge as well as the behavioral changes that we're making uh, continued focus while we're while we're proud and pleased with the work that we've done in safety culture we're by no means satisfied uh, as far as what that's going to look like on a continuing trend uh, not only using the tools that we've developed but with uh, with outside expertise to help us uh, continue to pulse safety culture on the site as well as human performance. And then I mentioned the, uh, the en engineering effectiveness piece uh, as far as what we're doing with uh, not only our new engineering staff, but in some cases our experienced engineering staff uh, getting back to the fundamentals of the design basis and technical rigor. In addition, uh, strong oversight and effective management of our corrective actions to prevent recurrence. Uh, for some of our deficiencies that are tied to the checklist, you know, those actions in place now and ongoing effectiveness reviews to make sure that uh, those actions remain vital uh, as well as the significant corrective actions to prevent recurrence that uh, are still on our plate for, for post restart. Uh, we're also actively continuing our trends. A question, Mr. Vega? No. Okay. Uh, we also you know, actively, very actively continuing our transition uh, to the Exelon fleet and the Exelon nuclear management model. Uh, and this is very detailed assessments of Fort Calhoun programs against that model. Uh, and implementation of action plans uh, to close the gaps to that model. And then ultimately, you know, full integration uh, into the fleet using that model, uh, you know, for day-to-day for, for -day operations. So as I mentioned, uh, we'll also be performing targeted independent assessments, primarily in three areas, corrective action program, I mentioned safety culture, uh, and engineering effectiveness. And with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Mr. Kerry to provide insights from our independent assessment organization. I've got one, one quick question. Uh, and it's probably just a, a matter of semantics, but in your slide it says these are the actions to continue performance improvement after restart. I guess my question is, does that mean that, that these actions aren't going to take place prior to restart? No, no, a, a, absolutely not. They're, as we mentioned, there's some lessons learned from the inspections, <coughs> primarily in the design area that, uh, that we're actively pursuing right now. As Mr. Prospero mentioned in, in, for example, the corrective action program, you know, the continual assessments that we're doing right now, and, and then ultimately, you know, it is incumbent uh, on myself as the chief nuclear officer to say that these programs uh, are, are in the, you know, in a condition that we would say uh, support restart. And, and so we do have actions in place right now across those programs. 
We just believe that they're just fundamental. You know, as we go back to our fundamental performance deficiencies, we can tie, you know, we can tie, uh, you know, uh, you know, a con some cases a string through a number of our activities. Then we believe these fundamentals will, will continue to provide stronger oversight of them. Okay, thank you. Kerry. Thank you, Lou. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kerry Enan. I am the Nuclear Oversight Manager at OPPD. As the Nuclear Oversight Manager, I am completely independent from the nuclear chain of command, and I report to corporate OPPD Vice President Mo Dogman. I spoke to you at the last public meeting about the Strengthened Independent Assessment Program and offered my independent perspectives on Fort Calhoun performance. Tonight, I'll update you on those activities. First, I'd like to discuss the work of the Safety Audit and Review Committee. This is a collegial body made up of five independent experts that report directly to the OPPD Chief Executive Officer and to the Board of Directors. These outside experts provide independent review of the performance of Fort Calhoun, and the results of their observations are reported directly to the, the CEO and to the Board. In their most recent assessment in December, the committee noted that the station is making progress in resolving issues. Their decisions are reflected in an appropriate bias towards nuclear safety and that the employees are engaged and have an appreciation for the higher standards and clarity of direction provided by the new leadership team. The committee also had constructive feedback in several areas. For example, the pace of change was slower than the committee expected. The committee also provided the recommendation for the solution of the containment electrical penetrations. My organization also recommended the current course of action and the station is replacing those penetrations. Each of the findings and observations by the Safety Audit and Review Committee are entered into the Corrective Action Program. Now I'd like to share with you some of the results of my staff's independent assessment of Fort Calhoun performance. My team of 20 individuals perform inspections, audits, and assessments of station activities. Our role is to challenge the station behaviors, their adherence to standards and expectations, and identify improvements needed and any gaps to excellence. Here are just a few examples of things that we have recently identified. My organization has challenged the staffing levels that the station maintains for emergency response. The station has personnel who are trained in the various responsibilities and ready to respond in cases of an emergency. There are a number of on-site personnel that could augment these current staffing levels. In response, the station is conducting training to increase the number of people in various roles available to respond in an emergency. In another example, my staff identified that high-pressure safety injection pumps under certain conditions may operate outside of vendor recommendations. The station is currently working to resolve this issue. My team has also challenged line management to be more involved in training activities. The line managers need to demonstrate ownership for the training program. They need to help define training expectations and attend and evaluate the effectiveness of training. In response, a comprehensive training program has been developed and line management involvement is tracked weekly by the station management. In addition, during physical work in the plant, my staff performs required inspections of work quality specified in work instructions as quality control hold points. Work cannot proceed until it is reviewed by my staff. We found that station procedures had allowances for not completing these required inspections under certain circumstances. This is not acceptable. I, as the nuclear oversight manager, should be the only person who can authorize not performing required inspections. The station is changing the procedures to incorporate this new requirement. Similar to the Safety Audit and Review Committee, my organization is seeing improvements in station performance. These are a few examples of the contribution that nuclear oversight staff is making to enhance safety at Fort Calhoun. In closing, these two aspects of independent assessment, the Safety Audit and Review Committee and nuclear oversight, are providing intrusive, independent examination of station performance. I'd now like to return the presentation back to Lou for closing remarks. Thanks, Kerry. Tonight we provided an update on the many activities we have underway to recover and restart Fort Calhoun Station. Overall, we believe we've made significant progress recognizing the work that's still ahead of us. Our remaining actions are understood, planned, and scheduled for completion. 
and we are on schedule to submit our restart, restart readiness report to the NRC in May. We're going to continue, continue driving to safe restart and we put in place our plan for sustained improvement that contains the necessary culture, organizational focus, as well as just personal dedication of every member of the Fort Calhoun station. I'd now like to turn the presentation over back to Mr. Bagel. Thank you. Mr. Cortapassi and to your staff, thank you very much. I think we had a very good discussion. I'd like to thank you for, you know, we had quite a lot of questions and some quite intrusive and I really appreciated the, the frank answers. Before I give an overview, I really appreciated the, uh, the video on the containment penetrations. I think it was good for, for everybody to be able to see actually what the penetrations are, what the issue is. And, I appreciate you using that tool. That was really good. You know, now going back to, and we talked about the readiness for the people, the equipment, and processes. And let me encourage you to continue on the people and the things. You cannot do enough in making sure that the operators are ready to, to take over the plant. The plant has been in cold iron for some time and make sure you use operating experience and use every opportunity possible to make sure that the operators are ready, including, and I'm glad you're, you're looking at <coughs> the procedures, including fixing the procedures is the important. That, I think that's gonna be key as, as we go down a, uh, down a pipe. And as Mike said, we will be out there and we will be independently evaluating the readiness for the operators. They, they have to be ready. You talked about the equipment. You have done a lot, and we've seen a lot of work being done to, to fix the plan. And, and, and that's good. A lot of, still a lot of work remains, but that's, a, that's, that's really encouraging. And, and hearing Mr. Eden say that his folks are out there watching, independently evaluated, that's, that's very good. That, that's good practice and continue doing it. But then too, we will continue to independently be checking those as well. Now, in talking to the processes, the most important one is the corrective action program. And I, yeah, I think you're there on the identification from a lot of issues are being identified, but still on the quality of the evaluation and making sure that you follow through is so very important. And you know, I got a sense that you're not quite there yet. And a piece of it is the design and licensing basis issues. I, and I'm glad you recognize that issue. And it's gonna take some time to address it, but also is encouraged to hear that you're looking at the important safety system, doing the walk downs and verifying that you have a good understanding of the design and licensing basis and the configuration today. So that's good. And I'd like to encourage you to keep keep on those efforts. I mean, uh, just Stepping back a little bit, you know, you heard us talk a little bit about what we've seen, done some inspections. Um, yep, you're making progress, but still there's, on the confirmatory action letter, you know, the restart checklist item, there's, there's still none that we've, we've inspected them, but that we have closed yet. And there's more work that we need to do to independently evaluate it. But before we can do our independent evaluation, you need to complete your work. So with that, I would encourage you to focus on the quality. That's going to be the key as we continue on with that. So with that, I think this closes the business portion of the meeting. We'll take a 10-minute break, and then uh, we'll turn over the meeting to Rick Deese. While, while we're getting settled, I, I do want to make a clarification. I did say that you can put your questions on the note cards. We will take comments. I will just read just comments out on the note cards. So, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a question. I've only got one note card. I have some here if anybody wants some. I'm going to go ahead and uh, raise my hand here. Okay. All right. Okay. And again, there's some at the table back there. Okay, now it's time for the question and answer session. It's your turn. Uh, I'd like to establish some ground rules that we've used here before. Those of you who have been to prior public meetings here know, basically know these, but uh, they work pretty good. Uh, we, uh, we 
got finished with the presentation at about 8.15. We're going to go ahead and give a, about a true hour for comments and questions. So we'll, we'll go to 9.15, counter to what I said earlier. Uh, but we want to hear that everyone who wants to speak or provide a comment via comment card or question, it gets that opportunity to be heard. So please keep your statements brief. If you've got a, uh, a long dissertation already spelled out, try and keep it down to about two or three minutes. Summarize that so we can get to everybody. If you've got several points you want to make, go ahead and make one, or, and we'll, uh, you can come back after everyone's had an opportunity <coughs> to get their say. If it gets down to when you ask a question and an interchange gets going back and forth between you and one and a party up here, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and cut that off and ask that the the exchange happen after the meeting. Uh, we just can't afford to bog down in the question and answer session in, in individual exchanges. And for the purpose of this meeting, let's focus on the safety of the Fort Calhoun station. Let's stray away from fiscal matters with OPPD. Those uh, can best be handled at maybe an OPPD board meeting. And I do know if you got, if re it's really a burning question, uh, OPPD Public Affairs is here and you can speak with those individuals after the meeting. Now, again, only one note card. The note cards are back there. Get them to one of the, oh, we got another one coming. Get them to the staff and they'll get them to me. Now, just due to the layout, uh, we're going to try something a little different. Normally, we stagger in a line. I, I will still do the line method, but I'm going to go do, if those of you remember, Phil Donahue from his old TV show. I'll work the crowd and, uh, and go to individual people who raise their hand. Uh, but uh, if the line forms, I'll do a question or two from there, read a comment, and then work the crowd. So I'm going to intermingle all the available methods for questions and comments. And lastly, I want to emphasize respect. We've got a lot of differing opinions here. A lot of, some of them uh, you know, aren't that favorable to using nuclear energy for making electricity. <coughs> Let's just keep it civil. Uh, the strong opinions are there. Let's respect each other. And we'll go ahead and begin. Now, when I do get uh, to you, I would like three things. One is state your name, any affiliation you wish to be, uh, to, to bring out about yourself, and then who you're actually pointing the question to, whether it be Fort Calhoun Station Management or the NRC. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening. I have a comment to start off the evening. My name is David Brown. I'm the president of the Greater Omaha Chamber of Commerce. And I thank you for the opportunity to, to speak tonight. And I wanted to maybe frame the conversation here a bit to realize the importance that OPPD and this particular service provides to the community. Uh, I want to thank OPPD and the NRC for the work they've done to obviously figure out a way to make this plant safer. Um, I thank the folks for all the work they've done during the repairs before, during, and after the flood. The OPPD team has been thorough and professional and transparent in keeping the community and community partners like us and our, our business members updated on their progress. OPD is a well-respected organization in the community and there's a high expectation that they should be and are engaged in efforts to make Omaha an even better place to live, work, play, and in our case, just have a business. They've been doing it so for, for so long that it's a significant level of trust that they will make decisions based on what is in the best interest of the community. As a publicly owned utility, their only interest is in safely providing quality, low cost, consistent electric service to this market. They're great partners. Whether the project entails planting trees or redeveloping neighborhoods or encouraging economic development, Omaha can always count on OPPD to be engaged. They're represented on many local boards and committees and provide volunteers for community activities. In short, they're more than just our power provider. With regard to the Fort Calhoun station, I can't emphasize enough how important that this facility is as a part of the diverse fuel mix in OPPD's generation portfolio. This diversity has served the ratepayers well because it balances out the highs and lows of various generation sources and costs associated with them. 
It's important to keep Fort Calhoun Station as part of our portfolio. With the political winds constantly changing with regard to appropriate fuel sources, Fort Calhoun represents an important asset as coal, natural gas, and oil could become more expensive and less available to use. This mix of fuel sources is also important to our growing economy. Because of our structure as an OPVD power, as a public power state, OPVD's rates are more than 18% below the national average. In a state with less than a competitive tax rate, having a competitive advantage in the cost of electricity enables us to provide a reasonably priced environment for existing businesses as well as new businesses considering expanding into this market. As an example, a recent economic development success, Fidelity Investments, announced a $200 million data center project in this market and cited Nebraska's low power rates and high reliability as one of the reasons they chose the state. In conclusion, I know that OPPD is as committed as you are to ensuring that the Fort Calhoun plant be reopened and restarted only if it is safe to do so. As soon as it passes, passes muster, it's important to get the facility back online to ensure a continuation of available low cost and high reliable power for our, our region. Thank you. Okay, I have a couple of gentlemen here in the middle. Thank you. Uh, Mike Ryan, and this is a question for the NRC. Uh, is the NRC aware that a guard at Fort Calhoun shot himself in the leg? Yes. Are you aware that he was fired? I'm not aware of he was fired. Okay. I, you haven't been told about that part of it. Uh, personnel matters on issues like that generally don't come to us. Okay. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Prospero. Uh, where does the shooting show up in the accident graphs that you've been showing us? That was not at work. Pardon? That was not at work. My microphone work that the gentleman got injured was not at work, did, did not occur at work. Okay. Uh, was this uh, uh, a weapon that he would use at work? Negative. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go into uh, a little something else now. <clears throat> Am I who? No. No, I'm, I'm a rate payer in Omaha. <laughs> One thing I would appreciate that one person talks at a time, it was Mr. Ryan's turn to talk, and to think just from a control from a meeting that you would just don't speak up, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, since at least 2003, uh, Fort Calhoun has been out of compliance with its license regarding flood protection. Despite the NRC's yellow finding in 2010 uh, for flood protection violations, Fort Calhoun still has not fixed the problems. In fact, most NRC inspection reports since 2010 cite additional violations regarding to aspects of flood protection at Fort Calhoun. Uh, it's disconcerting to find that the restart checklist basis document indicates at item 2.A that facility structures, systems, and components are to be restored to the condition that existed prior to the 2011 flood. The inspection reports demonstrate clearly that the pre-flood conditions at the plant were inadequate and failed to comply with OPPD's license. Why does the restart checklist basis document indicate that OPPD need only restore the plant to pre-flood conditions instead of requiring full compliance with Fort Calhoun's license. Yeah, I'll answer that question. Uh, first of all, the, you know, what, what we're ensuring is that anything that was affected by the flood is fixed. And definitely if anything is not in compliance with either a licensing or a design requirement, We'll be addressing that also. Uh, we're not, the intent of what we stated in that wasn't to just restore it to how it was if it wasn't in the proper condition to begin with. Uh, matter of fact, I think you, you made point of, of noting that we are identifying issues that, you know, weren't uh, uh, proper 
and and we're writing violations on those and the licensee is fixing those so we're we're not just ensuring that they restored something to how it was before we're ensuring that not only is it restored but it is restored properly thank you okay I'm going to go to the first comment card and question and it kind of points the question to the NRC but I want to send it to uh, Fort Calhoun station first and then probably just a quick follow-up with the NRC the NRC panel seemed to be surprised by OPPD's response in regards to the raw water pump elbows does OPPD have the regulatory elbow room to ask for a license amendment for the raw water pump piping yeah, I'll start with that and run certainly you and Bruce can add and uh, as we discussed and as was discussed in the most recent inspection report uh, we believe we've made a, a significant improvement in the strategy uh, with the modifications that we've made uh, to to control cell level uh, what we're standing back and looking at right now is uh, is recognizing that that change uh, for all intents will probably require a license amendment request and before we put that strategy into implementation and into use in our procedures we, we would follow the process for that Bruce Ron I don't know if you have anything addition no I think that's correct as I indicated I mean I, we're eventually going to probably submit a license amendment request for the bypass modification that I talked about during my presentation it just hasn't been fully vetted through the management chain and we, that we have agreed to do that but I think we're leaning in that direction yeah, and, I, and I think from from our perspective I mean we've 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 been having a lot of communications on this yeah. issue and uh, uh, there there's really not any surprise uh, maybe my question uh, might have uh, people might have thought that I was surprised but uh, we, we we've been actively communicating on this issue uh, I think the only question that I had was when I read that that they were evaluating whether or not they were going to reclassify the piping or not uh, I I wasn't aware that they were at that state today uh, a couple of weeks ago we had our exit and uh, uh, you know we haven't heard from them yet if they plan to deny the violation or accept the violation so uh, typically if a licensee plans to deny something we we hear about it you know through communications first and then in writing and since I hadn't heard anything you know that was my element of surprise is I wanted to find out are you planning to, to deny it before we talk about it thanks okay I've got a question over here and then I'll go right back to the line uh, my name is Bill Collins I'm a ratepayer uh, here's my question and this is uh, towards the OPD management Given the 2011, 2011 electrical fire of the 480 volt electrical bus, which caused extensive damage and cost millions to repair, how do you explain the hundreds of fire impairments which are unresolved and include metal roll up doors in the switchgear rooms meant to contain the spread of an electrical fire? Yeah, I'll start with that. Re recognizing we're in a refueling outage right now, in the back end of a refueling outage, we do have. Uh, you know a fair amount of equipment out of service and so part of that is is putting a fire impairment in place as well as some in many cases a continuous fire watch and compensatory actions it's part of our department readiness as part of our system readiness as part of our plant readiness and this is even in a I'll say a normal refueling outage we would look at backlogs of all deficiencies including fire impairments and our goal is to drive that down to as low as reasonably achievable especially as we continue to work through work windows uh, make systems operational and in some cases that's you know a, a door that might be propped open right now so that would facilitate work going on in the plant and, and that will be very aggressively scrubbed and reduced as I mentioned uh, to the minimal level as we as we approach systems ready for restart so what we've also done is um, all condition reports action reports work orders all that type of stuff is being coded for the proper time when we need it some for fuel load, some for heat up, some for start up, and we are in the process of doing all that as we speak. And there are some of those very items on those modes. Yeah, and, and, and I'll just close. And in, in, uh, this was an additional item that Nuclear Oversight has uh, has pointed out to us that we've taken actions on, and it's it's called the control of combustible material. As I mentioned, even with the extensive work going on, how we maintain housekeeping in the proper order. Uh, we've established a full-time fire marshal. Uh, as a new position to go take 
uh, to take the, the central lead on site for all things fire related because there's an engineering component, there's a maintenance component, there's an operational component, and that fire marshal will be the, the head on the horse per se uh, to go drive actions and to keep that very visible uh, in front of us and in front of the management team as a priority work item, you know, going forward as if, you know, as, as fire impairments, you know, continue uh, to, can continue to come up and that we work them off in an aggressive manner. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Bernie Tompkins, right pay here. <clears throat> I've uh, been around here for 50 plus years since uh, 62 and used to fly around the uh, plant out there at Fort Calhoun. Never thought much of it as a risk working uh, at the underground uh, building at SAC where you had a nuclear bomb from maybe the Russians that would incinerate you. However, that's uh, long gone now and uh, the biggest risk I see is the nuclear plant. I'm not against a nuclear plant, but I am very disappointed in the officers of uh, the OPT, OPPD board, o OPD, OPPD over the years, and uh, the board members that never addressed what we're addressing here. And uh, I think that uh, the oversight of the um, NRC is most important to maintain the safety of the city of Omaha. Thank you. I'll go one more here in the line. Good evening. My name is Peter Koenig Wilcox. I am a concerned citizen. I uh, live in Omaha. I'm also an employee out of the Fort Calhoun Station. And uh, I'm here tonight acting as the chair of our NAYGN. NAYGN is the North American Young Generation in Nuclear. And it's a, it's a group that unites a lot of young professionals who are excited about the nuclear power, uh, nuclear industry, science and technology. And it unites us, it helps us share our passion, and we're able to participate in uh, a lot of different activities. Some help the community and some help uh, professional development. Now, I'm here tonight, and I, I want to, I've got comments, so I don't have a question for you guys. But I, I do have some comments I'd like to say, and I think it's uh, some important things that some people might like to hear. Uh, one, I, I'd like to talk about some of the progress that's been made. Now, being in the trenches, being in a young employee out there, working every day, working long, hard hours, being away from the family, it really reminds you of why we're working. And I know I'm not the only one, but you know, when, you've, when, you, when you drive it to work in the dark, you go home in the dark, you realize you know, that you're making a commitment. I, I mean, there's no question, I'm engaged. There are plenty of employees that are engaged. And it's, that, that really comes down to, you know, why, why I come to work every day. It's for the ratepayers, it's for the people in this room, it's for my family. And overall, it's the safety of the plant. It's the safety of the city. It's the safety of the environment, safety of the area. I, I'm excited to be in nuclear power. It's a clean energy. I'm excited about that. Um, and some of the things that I can tell you that have changed since I've started working at OPPD. The communication has, has it's gotten so much better, you, you wouldn't even believe it. You know, when I first started working at OPPD, you know, met with a supervisor, gave me work, that kind of stuff. We have one-on-one -on -one meetings every month. And this, uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is a standard for the industry. The, the best performing plants have this, you know, they communicate up and down. And I can tell you right now, that is happening out at the plant. I can communicate, I can bring up an issue, and I, I, I am fully confident that it will be handled correctly, promptly, and efficiently. The work getting done, I know we've punched some numbers and every, every week we've got alignment meetings and uh, every day even. Seeing the numbers of the items that need to be done, seeing that dwindle down, that's a huge morale booster. And it's one of the things, you know, I talked to a couple members of the NAYGN earlier today and they wanted to say, you know, that's, that's impressive. They are, they are proud to be able to see that number go down and get, getting closer to startup. But ultimately we are, it's, it's safety. And we are proud that we are doing it in a safe manner now, <clears throat> responding to injuries is probably one of the biggest things that I can say is a huge progress out of the plant. Now, we respond to the Band-Aid on the finger so that we don't have to react to something bigger. And we respond to every injury appropriately. And I feel that that's, that's a huge contributor to our success as far as safety and injuries go. Another thing is, uh, I'm almost done, sorry, I guess. Uh, 
But uh, one thing supervisors do is they, they, they make a lot of observations, and since that's happened, a lot of the human performance things have gone down. I think that's, that's really important. I think some of these insights I'm providing, I don't, I don't think that gets out a lot, but when you, when you know your supervisor is there and he's, he or she is reiterating what you need to do and you know what you're doing, it really helps. And you're, you're aligned, we're driving, we're, we know the direction we're going, and we're, we're doing the right thing. I'm confident that come close to startup, if I have a safety issue, I'm one phone call away from stopping startup. Thank you for listening to me. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brian Flaherty. I'm with the National Safety Council. Um, I've been with the Safety Council for nine years. And when somebody asks me what is the ideal member of the Safety Council, hands down, I always say OPPD. And I have about 87 pages of training that they have done just in the last five years with us. They've trained over 971 employees with us, spent almost $160,000. So when we talk about safety cultures and doing the right thing when it comes to safety, this is a proof that they do take safety serious. And it's not just the managers and the directors. It's Gary Gates who is on our board. It's Kevin McCormick who is on our board. We actually have an award named after OPPD. It's a Service to Community Safety Award, which established in 1964 encourage effective action in the community by safety for a nonprofit organization. And they've donated that. They've worked with us on this award. So we're very happy to be a great partner with Omaha Public Power District. And just alone, they've won the Honor Platinum Award for the last 11 years, a company that sustains the superior safety and health programs for more than 10 consecutive years. So my hat goes off to OPPD and their safety programs. And again, we talked about safety culture. It was in just about every slide over there. We're not the only ones that help them with their safety culture. It's the people that will make that culture work. We can give them the policies, the procedures, everything they need to make it work. They have to implement it. And working with the OPPD people, if I'm not talking to them at least once a week, I feel like something's wrong because that's how engaged they are in safety. And again, it's not just the line workers. It's everybody at OPPD. It's the first aid CPR training we provide for them. So again, my hat's off to them. So it shows their commitment to safety. And that's all I have to say. And thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Good evening, I'm Mary Ann Kresman. I live at 1902 O Street in Omaha. The NRC's public outreach efforts regarding Fort Calhoun Station needs a lot of improvement. It has been more than four months since the NRC's last public meeting in Nebraska. Regardless how busy the NRC is, public meetings should be convened in Nebraska at least every two months so that the public has a fighting chance to be current with the developments. The NRC's testimony to the Nuclear Regulatory Commissioners on January 8th of this year regarding its public outreach overstated the number of public meetings held in Nebraska last year. O350 panel vice chair Louise Lund incorrectly told the commissioners that the panel had conducted seven public meetings in Nebraska. In reality, the NRC held only five public meetings in Nebraska and one open house last year. In addition, more time needs to be devoted at each meeting to public comments and questions. The NRC's February 12th meeting held in California regarding the San Onofre nuclear plant used a format that should be used here. Segments for public comment were interspersed between several presentation segments during the first half. Then the second half was devoted entirely to public comments and questions. This format, which is a much more effective communication technique, avoided the mind-numbing blocks of repetitive presentation that occurs at our meetings. Another problem is that the NRC has again chosen the Double Treat Hotel for a meeting venue, even though it is inconvenient for many members of the public. Parking is a major hassle, Finding one's way around in this labyrinth is difficult and frequently discourages people from attending. <clears throat> Concerns about this location were brought to the panel's attention last year with several suggestions of better venues. Each also has easier access from the interstate. <clears throat> I do not understand why the NRC persists in holding its public meetings in poor venues except to discourage attendance. A further problem is the NRC's needlessly slow posting of meeting videos regarding Fort Calhoun. The NRC has claimed that posting has to wait for transcription 
which takes a month or longer. In contrast, the videos of the public meetings the NRC holds regarding the San Onofre plant are posted without transcription within a day or two of those meetings. When the videos for the Fort Calhoun meetings are eventually posted online, they frequently use a low quality instead of a high quality setting. This makes the video and sometimes the audio look and sound like the meeting was held underwater. This also has been brought to the NRC's attention, but the problem continues. Another example of extremely poor audio is the December 12, 2012 public meeting held at the NRC headquarters regarding the containment internal structure, uh, in containment internal structure problems at Fort Calhoun. The audio for the public who attempted to listen by phone was so poor that it was effectively inaudible for most of the meeting. Yet another problem is the NRC's untimely and inconsistent posting of documents on the special website. Rather than being posted within a few days of a document date, the NRC generally waits until shortly before a public meeting before posting most of the documents. <clears throat> Some key documents, like the December 31st, 2012 integrated inspection report, still have not been posted. It's time the NRC steps up its game and fixes its glaring public outreach problems. First, appreciate the feedback. There is room for improvement. You know, regarding this venue, it, you know, there's, we, we've tried to change it in different areas, getting it closer to Blair. We've done it, and then, but we also received feedback from folks that they wanted the meeting here in Omaha as well. So we're trying to keep a balance with that. But I do appreciate your feedback regarding the, the, the teleconferencing that makes it difficult. <coughs> we need to improve in that area, as well as can the reports posted earlier, and we'll work on that. And as a video, that's, gonna, that's, a, that's a challenge. We've heard it now several <coughs> times, and we'll take it on to see if we can improve in that area. <coughs> One thing on the videos, it's, it's funny that you brought that up. We've, we've had a lot of challenges with the uh, <coughs> company that uh, does the transcription for us. So Laura Uselding and I decided that the next one, what we're going to do is we're going to immediately, we have to post it on our website anyway with transcription. But in order to get it out there quicker, we're going to immediately post it to YouTube uh, as we do a lot of our other meeting minutes while we're waiting for the transcription to get done. And then when the transcription's done, we'll have that one also on the public web page uh, in addition to what we have on YouTube. And I'll just add, you know, we, we try to use technology to the best of our ability to, to support the public being involved in what we have to do. Uh, I know with respect to posting documents on our special oversight website, uh, which isn't required, but we're doing it to support public outreach. Uh, I know that for the revised CAL and for the revised basis document, I had those documents put onto that website the same day, if not the day after, uh, we put those documents into Adams. Uh, you, you did mention there was a December 31st re, uh, report, and that one might have not gotten posted, ma'am. I'd have to go look. Uh, but uh, but we, we do try uh, to get those reports and those, those uh, documents put into that site as soon as we can. Uh, and maybe if you want to talk to me after the meeting, because I'm not sure if, if you're aware, but you can go to the NRC's website, and, and, I, and I, I don't know exactly where it's at, but, but I do know there's a place where you can request to receive every document instantly that the NRC puts into the public record related to Fort Calhoun as soon as it's, as soon as it's issued. And I, I would just tell you that would be a much, a, a much better mechanism for you to get everything instantly versus waiting to go to that website to get it. And, and I, I, I know we've got documentation up at the front desk that, that tells you how to do that. And if you don't mind coming and talking to us afterwards, we, we, we'd be more than happy to, to help you get that. I'm Wally Taylor with the Iowa 
a chapter of the Sierra Club, and I have a question for the O350 panel. Looking at all the information and the reports that we have, we know that uh, there were problems at Fort Calhoun with the uh, containment internal structures, <coughs> support columns and beams. It's going to take a lot of work and changes in order to uh, repair those and bring them up to um, the proper functioning and design standards. Uh, the flood protection um, is going to take a lot of work and changes to bring that up to standards and if OPPD uh, is accurate in what they've said, they're going to go above that. That's going to take a lot more uh, work and changes to the plant. Um, there are reactor containment pen penetration seals that have to be modified because they were Teflon. Teflon has been um, known since the 1980s not to be the appropriate uh, material to use for those penetration seals. Um, my understanding is that uh, not all the design basis documents are uh, accounted for. Some are an, an, a missing or not uh, being able to be found. Uh, we know that the plant was built on karst geology, which is fractured limestone bedrock. And that was known at the time that the uh, plant was first licensed. And then the most recent inspection report dated March 11th notes two flooding mitigation changes that should have required a license amendment, but OPPD did not seek a license amendment. So given all of that, why is the NRC not requiring OPPD to apply for a license amendment? I, I don't think we've ever said that we're not requiring that. The, the, the report said that those modifications, in our opinion, required an amendment. Uh, and, uh, you know, the licensee has 30 days to respond to that and tell us if they uh, agree with that or not. Um, so I guess to answer your question, we're, we're not saying that. But it's more than just that last inspection report. It's all the other items that I indicated that are going to take a lot of changes, a lot of uh, design and construction modifications that, that you would think would require a license amendment. Yeah, and I, I guess ra rather than go through the list that you gave, and that is a good list, uh, there's, there's a number of issues that we're currently looking at that may require licensing amendments. Uh, you know, if I wanted to talk directly to each one of yours for the containment structure, possibly not, because the licensee is looking at restoring the structure to its licensing basis. With respect to the flood, we just said maybe, uh, you know, right now, based on the mods they're doing, we would say yes, a licensing amendment is needed for the modifications that they've made. For containment penetrations, it doesn't look like a licensing amendment will be needed because they're restoring compliance to the original licensing basis. With respect to the DBDs, you know, I don't know how that ties to a licensing amendment without knowing the specifics of what element of the DBD uh, that you're talking about. But, but I guess what, what I'm getting at, sir, is, you know, you, you bring up a great question. And it's a question that we are communicating with the licensee about because there, there, are, not, there are a number of, of issues that may require licensing amendments. The licensee is aware of that, we are aware of that, and we're currently working through that uh, question right now. And, and you know, I, I can't tell you exactly what state we're at because, like I said, we're waiting for the licensee to complete their evaluations. If a license amendment were required, would that be before restart? Well, yeah, no, let me, I, yeah, as part of the restart checklist, a specific line item and an action that we have is to identify the issues that we feel need to have a licensee of amendment, that's uh, item six, that we would re review and to make sure that the issues that require a license amendment are, are that they submit the request and that they're processed before restart. So that's a specific item in the restart uh, checklist. 
Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take one more from the line, and then I'm going to go over to the other side of the room. <coughs> Colleen Augustson, um, comments and a question. It's good to see the revision of the restart checklist and the basis document. The three chief additions reflect significant long-standing problems at Fort Calhoun Station, which absolutely must be resolved before restart is considered. <coughs> Congressman Terry's recent criticism of the NRC is off base. To assure public safety, we in the Midwest need and want thorough, rigorous, and proactive inspection and evaluation by the NRC regarding Fort Calhoun. We are also looking to the NRC to ferret out additional problems and expand the checklist and basis document further as additional deficiencies are revealed. If the NRC hasn't done so already, it needs to brief Congressman Terry so he has an opportunity to, under to correct his understanding regarding the restart checklist. That said, it is necessary to again point out that the restart checklist still fails to meet Manual Chapter 0350 requirements. No information whatsoever is provided regarding status for most items. Also, the root causes and corrective actions that require disposition or resolution prior to restart are still not listed as required. On top of that, neither the checklist nor the basis document is readily accessible for laypersons, despite NRC promises previously. One cannot, in fact, search on the VIO numbers in Adams and find the violation in the relevant documents, as Mr. Hay claimed at the November meeting. It's disappointing that the restart checklist basis document does not yet actually serve as a tool for the public to track developments in a timely fashion. This is because the NRC has not updated it as frequently as Mr. Hay promised at the last meeting. He committed to updates every six weeks. Instead, it's taken about four months since the original for us to see the first update. The jargon used in the basis document needs explanation. It seems evident that the term closed in the status column does not necessarily mean the problem is solved. Based upon review of thousands of pages of NRC inspection reports, licensing event reports, etc., it's clear that action items are frequently closed by OPBD without taking appropriate action. The NRC's March 11, 2013 inspection report also has a couple examples of closure without final resolution of the problem. These relate to OPPD's failure to obtain prior NRC approval for flood and mitigation strategies. So even if all the 450 plus items in the checklist basis document were designated as closed, that does not necessarily mean that all the issues at Fort Calhoun are resolved. So this is a question for the NRC. Where an issue is identified by the NRC during inspections and or valuations, Will the NRC require that issue to be fully corrected in order to consider restart? Not just addressed, but fully, uh, fully corrected, yes or no? Depends what the issue is, frankly. If, it's the, if it is a safety issue that needs to be addressed prior to plant restart, yes, it will be addressed prior to restart. We'll verify that. But not all issues are related that would impact the safety operation of the, of the plant. Does that answer your question? Um, and that, but and you asked a lot of, uh, covered a lot of area, but let me cover one that regarding uh, Congressman Lee Terry and his comments regarding the, the NRC revising the confirmatory action letter. Yesterday, Mike Hay and myself met with Congressman Terry and we explained why what the issues were that were added to the confirmatory action letter, why they're important from a safety perspective, and he did understand that. And one thing we, from uh, Congressman Terry, he understands that the safety of Fort, Fort Calhoun is paramount. So you explained that to him, because it didn't sound yes, like he did in the beginning, yeah, in the Excuse newspaper me? report. Yes, he okay. did, he did we explained it to him. Okay. Thank you. And just, okay. just well, hold, hold on, Rick. Just to uh, answer the question about updating uh, the basis stock, and I, I will agree with you, uh, you know, it's been four months since we updated that basis document. Uh, I'm not going to make any excuses for why it took so long, uh, other than there's a lot of things that, that we've been doing. But, but I will tell you, if you read our inspection reports that we issued, each one of those inspection reports, if an item is closed, 
that report will discuss what was inspected, how it was inspected, and the basis for its closure. And it, it will state exactly what item in the basis document it, it closed. So as long as you got one copy of the basis document, if you get the reports, you can keep track, you know, every time a report is issued, what the status is. And, and uh, you know, I can't tell you that, every, and I don't think I ever told anybody every six weeks we would do the basis doc. Every six weeks we do an inspection report, uh, but, but we're not going to be updating the basis document every six weeks also. Uh, but, but we are going to be updating the basis document when there's enough of a reason to update it. Uh, you know, recently we revised the CAL and we added things to, to the basis document. Soon we'll be issuing a number of team inspection reports that, that will address a large number of these, of these uh, basis document items. And, and then definitely we'll be updating the basis document so that you can keep track of that. But, uh, you know, the bottom line is I apologize that we're not, you know, updating that document as much as you would like. Uh, if I could, I would update it every six weeks, but, uh, but it's just, you know, I, I, I have to balance what we can do and, and uh, I'll, I'll try my best to do, to do it as often as I can. Okay, I'm way over here on this side of the room, and I have a comment. Uh, yes, I'd like to say that I do not think that we have a flooding problem. Right now, we are 1,000 feet above sea level, 1,000 feet above uh, Fukushima, Daiichi, the plant there, the nuclear... Uh, that, uh, uh, I also voted for um, President Obama. If you listen to the radio, you probably are concerned that this is not the best place for um, the political civility to exist. I voted against Congressman Lee Terry. I voted for the Democrat, to tell you the truth. Uh, uh, also in Iowa, I believe that uh, we have jihadists there, uh, who Congressman uh, Steve King, um, this uh, pertains really to the, uh, the good faith of uh, the NRC. I believe that you have an impossible task, as OPBD uh, does. I, my name is Kaufman, Joseph Kaufman. I am a ratepayer. Uh, uh, I believe that OPBD is following, is doing everything possible that it can do to satisfy the requirements, your requirements. Mr. Hayes letter here, uh, I dispute that there is a flooding problem because uh, there's a drainage situation. Uh, admittedly, right now we have a drainage problem right where we stand uh, in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, the, the water runs, uh, if we do not uh, have things correctly done, we will have, uh, we'll be, we'll have water at our feet. Uh, I, I think that we, uh, I, I've said plenty. Thank you. Got another question? Hello. Uh, my name is David Steinhauser, a rate payer. Um, this question is pointed toward the Fort Calhoun staff. Um, given the extended duration of the station shutdown, um, what has been changed in regards to the storage of the spent fuel rods? Um, what is the expected length of time of station operations after restart until the storage pool or pools will reach capacity? And when capacity is reached, will an additional storage pool be constructed or the oldest fuel be transferred to on-site storage casks, to another temporary storage location, or to a permanent storage site? should one ever be constructed. Thank you. Mike, Mike why, don't you, why don't you talk about current status, the length of the next fuel cycle, and then, Ron, maybe you can buddy on with the uh, current status of the independent uh, spent fuel storage installation and in the future uh, future moves that direction. As I said earlier, um, our, our goal is to uh, put the fuel back in the core in uh, mid-April. Mid um, when we start up the reactor, the typical cycle is 18 months, so we would run the reactor 18 more months. And there, therefore, um, we would have the fuel back in somewhere around mid-April. 
and then we'd run for 18 months after that. Run, we go about this to see. Sure. I mean, when we uh, when we shut down for a normal refueling outage every 18 months, we replace approximately one third of the fuel assemblies, which is there's 133 fuel assemblies in the reactor, and we replace approximately a third of those, say, so about 40 or 45. Uh, there is still ample space in the in the spent fuel pool for several more cycles of fuel assemblies to go into there. Once we reach filling those up, say in the later this decade, we would move towards the dry cast storage, which we're currently licensed for. Okay. Did you have a comment, Mr. Rick? Okay, we're about we got about 10 to 15 more minutes, so I'm going to ask the last several ones to kind of summarize if they have a big long question uh, yes my name is Linda Ryan I'm an Omaha ratepayer and I am honestly I'm a little disappointed the safety council guy and the Chamber of Commerce guy left because I want them I wish they could hear what I have to say <coughs> Fort Calhoun's failure to adequately design modify and maintain its electrical power distribution system resulted in the June 2011 fire in the safety related 480 volt switch gear these deficiencies resulted in a red finding having high safety significance. NRC inspectors noted in a November 13, 2012 inspection report that Fort Calhoun's bus separation scheme design does not meet the system's design criteria. Nevertheless, Fort Calhoun's corrective actions after the fire restored the original configuration of the 480 volt switchgear. According to the NRC, the 4160 VAC bus is still not protected against an arc fault event on the 480 VAC bus upstream of the 480 VAC feeder breaker, and this design vulnerability is still present. The NRC's February 14, 2013 inspection report indicates that Fort Calhoun has still not fixed the design vulnerability and instead is asserting that no problem exists. I want the NRC to know that I expect the agency to remain firm in requiring that Fort Calhoun's electrical distribution system be fixed so that this design vulnerability is removed prior to considering restart. I was also surprised to learn from the February 14th inspection report that a second fire occurred at Fort Calhoun apparently in May 2012. This second fire has not been publicly revealed previously. Why? I wonder why. The inspection report says that a load center failure involved a fire in an electrical load center that was de-energized on May 11, 2012. OPPD did not conduct the maintenance rule review until October 25, 2012 a very slow response. This represented yet another performance deficiency and a violation of NRC rules by OPPD. I'd like to hear from the NRC an explanation of what this second fire at Fort Calhoun involved. The, <clears throat> the second fire that you're referring to was in a small load center in a non-safety related um, component uh, in the plant and generally uh, when we're dealing with issues that aren't safety related uh, we won't uh, document those in inspection reports depending on what the issue is so for example uh, had you had a non-safety related fire that uh, that caused a response of the fire brigade such that you were taking resources away from everything else, that'd be a little bit different. But this particular issue was a, a non-safety related load center that as soon as it was de-energized, it put itself out, which is why it was not documented in a report. How long was it uh, before the fire was discovered? I'd have to look at my notes, Mrs. Ryan, but I, I'm talking, you know, very, very short amount of time because you have indications in the control room. You would have indications in the control room if you had an issue with a fire uh, based off of uh, gauge indications that would dispatch somebody there to look at it if they couldn't figure it out immediately. Okay. 
Okay, so you don't know exactly. Yeah, not, not off the top of my head. I've got notes I can find that out for you. Okay. Uh, we, could, it, we could provide some additional information it, it, on, on that it, question if you'd like. It, it appears that it may have caused some loss of electrical power. Is this, uh, in this case, how long was there a loss of power? Are you saying there wasn't? The, there wasn't a loss of electrical power to anything that was safety related. I mean, anytime you have a fire in any kind of a load center or breaker, you're obviously going to lose power to that because you have to, to uh, get rid of power to stop the fire. But there was no substantial, I mean, we're, we're only talking about the individual load center and the components off of that, okay, not so a, a site-wide 480 volt bus issue like they had in June 2011. Okay, but, but how long, or if it wasn't safety related, but still there was a loss of power, Maybe not safety related, but how long was that loss of power? It, it was an individual component in the intake structure, and I believe it was associated. It was eight or nine minutes, and I believe it was associated with a sump pump. Eight <coughs> or nine minutes. Okay. Um, and the system structures and components that were affected were just what? I mean, you know, it was not safety related, really, but like what? I believe it was a sump pump, ma'am. I'd yes. have to check my record. I'm sorry, I didn't. I, didn't. So I believe it was a sump pump. A sump pump, okay. All right, thank you. Okay, just uh, in order of, uh, I'm, uh, just in order to uh, bring the meeting to a close, I'm going to address everybody left in the line, and I apologize, and I'm going to ask the people in the line to go be brief. And if you have any questions, we still have those feedback forms back there. You can write a question on there, and we will uh, we'll get back to you. Lynn Moorer. I echo the comments of the two previous speakers regarding the O350 panel do list, in effect, the things they need to work on. Um, perhaps uh, you could regard those comments as a type of a checklist for yourself. And to clarify, the concern about the venue here is there are better locations in Omaha. It's not a question of between Omaha and Blair. It's a question of that when you meet in Omaha, there are many better venues that are more convenient, have better parking, et cetera. And those suggestions were provided to the panel last summer. Anyhow, I'm confident that you'll be able to um, rectify all these things if you direct attention to them. In December, OPPD revealed that more than a third of the columns and beams in the containment building, 47 of 135 beams and five of 14 columns, do not conform to Fort Calhoun's license. They don't meet acceptance criteria for working stress and or ultimate strength. OPPD indicated that loads on the beams and columns cannot support the loads they were designed for, much less the new power upright loads. OPPD also revealed in December that the containment internal structures were not built as designed. It also disclosed the calculations regarding these structures are incorrect, incomplete, or missing. In addition, inconsist inconsistencies exist between calculations and drawings. OPPD admitted that it has known since the 1990s about the missing calculations, but decided not to reconstitute them. NRC Branch Chief Michael Hayes stated at the January 8, 2013 briefing of the NRC commissioners that margins of safety at Fort Calhoun have clearly been affected because of these problems. OPPD argues that despite its nonconformance with Fort Calhoun's licensing basis, the containment internal structures are operable for outage conditions. Incredibly, OPPD proposes to wait to make any modifications to address these problems until after restart. However, the NRC recently cited OPPD a violation for failure to conduct an adequate operability determination. Among other things, OPPD got it backward. Rather than adopting a requirement to demonstrate that it is safe in order to proceed, OPPD adopted a requirement to demonstrate that it was unsafe in order to disapprove the action. OPPD's failure to build the containment internal structures according to design documents strongly suggests that many more system structures and components may not have been built to design specifications. The NRC needs to investigate design documentation, including all calculations plant-wide. The NRC's investigation needs to look both at the extent of the nonconformance and why it occurred. 
focus should not be limited to the non-conforming structures that OPPD is now seeking to justify. It's also critical that the NRC assign for this rigorous review personnel who have adequate expertise to see through OPPD's modeling. The meeting held in December at NRC headquarters regarding this problem was extremely hard to hear for the public attempting to listen in. Plus, the slides that were discussed during the meeting were not available to the public until well after the meeting. So the, M the public had very little meaningful opportunity to understand what was being discussed or give informed input. Will the NRC hold public meetings in Nebraska devoted to the containment internal structure problems at Fort Calhoun? This is mine. Uh, you talked about a lot of things, and uh, I guess to answer your last question first, will we have a public meeting in Omaha to discuss the containment internal structural issue? Uh, right now, I, I can't say yes or no to that. Uh, what I will tell you is we will have public meetings to discuss a lot of different things, of which the containment structure will be one of them. Um, you know, and just you, you, you made a comment that you hope that we have the right expertise. Uh, I can guarantee you, ma'am, uh, because I've been setting up getting the right expertise. Um, I, I hate to talk in lingo that most people don't know, but this is a very complex issue. Uh, you know, they're using a Gothic computer model to calculate the differential pressure from different accident scenarios and how that then gets put into a GT strudel finite element analysis. So it takes a lot of different experts to understand all that, along with the structural engineering experts who I have going to the site, walking down containment, looking at actually how it was built so that we can assure it was modeled right in the computer models. So, I mean, from, from my perspective, I share with you the same feeling. We need to have the right people looking at the right things. And to tell you the truth, there's a lot of complex issues at this site which is why, you know, one of my first statements was when the licensee is ready for our inspections, they really need to be ready because it's not easy for me to get the right expertise for all these different issues. It takes time. And so, you know, just to get to your, your uh, I guess, the essence of what you're talking about, the NRC definitely shares with you, you know, the feeling that we need to get the right people looking at the right things. Uh, I, I apologize for the way in which the meeting in December wasn't heard well. Uh, the phone system obviously did not work well at all. And uh, we, we will be having more public meetings. And I think you've convinced us we probably will try to stay away from the double tree. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but anyways, uh, you know, to get to, get to your, your answer, uh, yes, we will be inspecting the containment structure issue. We will be using our best, our best expertise to do it, and we will be communicating the results of our inspection activities, not only on the docket and on our special oversight website, but also in public meetings. And also, I'd like to add, you know, you brought up the point of extent of condition for issues, to not be just isolated on that one issue that's being resolved, like the containment structure, but is it, is there other important structures or components that could be impacted by the poor design drawing? Yes, we are looking at that. And that is part of our inspections in, that, in this uh, corrective action team that we just had on board. We did look at that more than just, did they just fix this issue, but is that same problem possibly in other systems that are important to safety as well. And also, we're going to be completing our uh, special inspection on the anchor bolts with the raw water pumps. That, in that inspection as well, we look at the extent of condition. Not only did we have to make sure that the licensee at Fort Calhoun looked at the extent of condition of that problem, but we also independently looked at other components to make sure that that kind of problem did not exist in other places as well. But, but thank you for your comments. Laverne Tran, right there. There was four fires total. 
Um, in the presentation, he mentioned one beam. There were six beams that failed design bases. And in their presentation, they said the Teflon seals were minimum. Well, actually, they were banned in the 1980s. Fort Calhoun was the only nuclear power plant left in the country with them. They said that they changed them to show that they exceeded their safety. Well, actually, they're just bringing the plant up to 1980 standards. That's what they're really doing. So this whole Teflon seals has really concerned me because OPPD has consistently, since the 80s, when they claimed that they were confused by your memo, that they replaced some of them based on safety-related equipment. And the other ones that were hooked to the radio, which is not safety rated, they didn't change. They, in this presentation tonight, they mentioned safety related equipment again. They still do not seem to understand that all penetrations in the containment building are considered safety related. At an executive meeting, Mr. Hansen also referred to them as safety and non-safety related. It is very clear that all penetrations in the containment building are safety related. <coughs> And the change of the Teflon seals is not bringing up to any kind of great safety. The existence of the 0350 board, for all of you people who gave this glowing report about how great and how beneficial OPPD is to the Nebraska state flag, well, guess what? This existence of this committee demonstrates that these people have not been running this plant ever safe. The existence of Teflon seals that were banned in the 80s demonstrates that this has not been run safely. Their responses in this meeting, they still seem confused about your 1980 memo. And they're touting this great change as exceeding safety values. I hope you're concerned as much as I am about the safety of that plan. The question I have for you guys, are you gonna mandate that they do x-ray penetration into the concrete building, into the containment structure, look for cold joints, as I've been informed there are in existence? I know you haven't looked in with x-ray equipment, but are you gonna mandate these people to do that? To really look into the concrete structure versus a hundred look downs and, oh, it's a very pretty wall, looks great. But you know, six of these beams failed during the upgrading process of 2007. So anyway, those are my statements and my question was, are you gonna demand that they do that? Yeah, I'm going to have to defer on answering that question because, uh, you know, right now I know we're not mandating that they do that, and I don't even know if they have done it already. Uh, uh, I, what I'd like to do is talk to you afterwards so I can really understand what your question is uh, so that I can get back to you and, and answer it properly. Six of these beams failed. They were concrete beams. Are the interior of that concrete structure cracking? Any kind of problems? Any cold joints when they laid the concrete structure originally in the 60s? And I, and I, and I will tell you, they have done some non-destructive testing to understand. Visual walk -down. No, they've done more than just visual walk downs. I think they even mentioned it in their, in their briefing tonight. But yeah, anyway. just, just for clarity, when we talk about failure, we're talking about analytical failure. No structural, no actual, no cracking, no visual. And as Mr. Rass mentioned, you know, some of the preliminary work that's done with, uh, you know, a radar sonar type. So it, it's, it's an analytical look, you know, taking some of the extreme, you know, conditions that could exist uh, that, that drives us to say that word, you know, fail or could fail. It's not an actual failure in the plant right now. Good evening. My name is Tim O'Brien. I'm a resident and a rate payer uh, of Omaha. There's been a lot of past weather related events that uh, have happened in Omaha over time that have caused outages. I want to thank the men and women with OPPD uh, for their response and the work that they've done in the elements. After hearing tonight's OPPD presentation and announcements or advancements, I'm convinced that uh, they will meet all the necessary requirements. Thank you. <clears throat> Ken Hansen, uh, I re represent the uh, University of Nebraska Medical Center. Uh, UNMC is the oldest and largest academic uh, medical center in the state of Nebraska, consisting of education, research, and patient care. Core strengths include cancer research, cancer treatment, and multiple organ transplant. Our mission and vision depend on the reliable and premium power of OPPD. 
We've had a long-standing relationship with OPP going back decades. Reliability is the highest of priorities to the medical center. OPP is engaged daily and weekly uh, uh, within the design and evaluation in, in, in assisting us in operation of our electrical plant, uh, automatic and manual switching of campus circuits and community circuits around us, provides backup support for electric equipment failures. OPPD has also earned UNMC's trust beyond electricity. We have partnered to reduce uh, energy on campus uh, by 20% over the last two years. We have jointly submitted successful grant applications resulting in millions of, of uh, dollars of funding uh, through the uh, 2009 stimulus funds. We have complete, competed successfully for the National Institute of Health grants using our diversity of fuel and generation as one measure of the criteria. Uh, one example of that is an $8 million uh, uh, award to uh, uh, totally renovate the existing Epley Cancer Center in Omaha. Beyond reliability, we depend on OPPD to provide a competitive edge to our business through the low cost of, uh, of uh, energy and communicating challenges uh, that may increase our energy cost as we go down the road. At the end of the day, UNMC has complete confidence in OPPD's leadership and the trust that they make the right decisions. And if I haven't thanked them recently, I, I thank the leadership and staff. Well, I guess I'm last. Um, my name is Mike Carberry, and I represent the Friends of the Earth. I'm their nuclear campaign coordinator for the Midwest. Been spending the last three years on trying to stop a nuclear power plant, a new one in Iowa. And we've been a little bit distract distracted by San Onofre, but uh, let you know that uh, we are paying attention to what goes on here at uh, Fort Calhoun Station. There's a lot of people that live downstream and downwind. We're concerned about their safety. And as what, what we're talking about here tonight is safety, I, I would really love to open the debate to talk about uh, that nuclear power is not, uh, as the industry would have us believe, uh, clean, safe, and cheap, but in actuality, dirty, dangerous, and expensive. And so we're focusing on safety, and OPPD's uh, slideshow presentation was uh, very impressive. They went from last to first in industrial safety overview, and last to maybe the mid-30s in human performance overview. But, of course, these uh, numbers were from January 2012 to March of 2013. I believe the plant was closed all during that time. And since this is a baseball season, and I'm going to use a small analogy here, it's like hitting 400 in, this, in spring training. But we all know that sometimes 400 hitters in spring training fail to really make it in, uh, when regular season starts. So I guess uh, my question really is, how can the citizens of Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri, and everybody else that's downwind and downstream feel safe that these safety concerns that we've heard tonight are going to be taken care of? And we would like to see that the regular season doesn't start until we know all those safety issues are taken care of. So I, I guess that question might be, to both the OPPD and to the NRC. Make us feel safe, please. Well, yeah, I look. can tell you, and speaking on behalf of the O350 panel and any, any NRC staff, we are gonna conduct thorough and independent reviews of the actions that we've identified in the confirmatory action letter. And, it, and as necessary, modify the confirmatory action letter as necessary to make sure that Fort Calhoun is safe to restart. Yeah, and I'd like to touch on, I'll start with the industrial safety statistics, excuse me. And we did show, uh, you know, graphical representation. Uh, also, the number of work activities, the number of, number of additional workers, the number of very complex activities that we're doing, and we're doing it injury free. So as we've even seen in the nuclear industry, in, in some cases during a refueling outage, when there is that much coordination going on compared to normal power plant operations, that uh, some utilities see a spike up in injuries during refuel outage. And, and we've obviously been in an extended period with extended amount of additional work, and so we're quite proud of that safety record. As we've inculcated with the employees, uh, when we do it safely, when we do it error-free, we're actually able to execute the schedule uh, as designed and that extra time that we take in preparation 
uh, in mitigation, in, uh, in additional eyes, additional oversight, additional supervision is how we've been able to achieve both. You know, getting it there safely uh, as well as improving the efficiency at the station, whether I'm talking safety or human performance. And as I mentioned, with a lot of new workers and with a lot of additional supplemental workers uh, supporting the work activities that we're doing. Okay, well, we've reached the end, and I apologize that we can't hear from everybody with their questions, but uh, we have to come to a conclusion. I want to stress those feedback forms on the back table. Let us know how we did. Several of you let us already know how, we have, how we've been doing, but we'll take those comments to heart and any ones you send to us on those feedback forms, which are, I'll reemphasize, postage paid and already addressed to us. I want to just summarize that the NRC, we are open to the public and we keep, that is one of our high priorities. Please visit our website. We have much information on that website, not just relative to Fort Calhoun. You can find uh, all sorts of information on other plants and activities with the NRC. I want to put another plug. You've heard several references to our special website for Fort Calhoun. That is also available. Okay. Our next meeting is going to be in a couple months. We have been, we'll send out a meeting notice to let everyone know that uh, that is coming, and we look forward to seeing you there. Just a reminder, the staff will be available, NRC staff will be available immediately after the meeting. If you have that one burning question that we didn't get to that you want to ask, uh, we will be available after the meeting for discussions. With that, I thank you for your attendance, and good night. <laughs>